G'day ladies and gents. Welcome back to the potty. This was a lovely little chat with Mr. Ryan Flurry. Uh, for those of you who don't know him, Ryan's the man behind the tools or engine, if you could call it that, uh, that I use down in C, uh, also known as Telescope. And uh, he's just an absolute champion when it comes to programming. And I have him to thank for introducing me to the low levels, teaching me the ropes of everything. Uh, he was there when I could uh, could no longer turn to the lovely C++ STD strings. And uh, he continues to be the guy that I look up to whenever I've got difficult problems that just don't solve themselves. So to kick things off, if you're not too interested in programming, I really don't think you're going to get much out of this conversation. If you do enjoy programming though, and uh, even in the upper levels like C Sharp or JavaScript or C++, if you can call that upper level, uh, we tried our best to get the terms established so you should be able to follow along with most of, if not all of it. Uh, probably not the segment where Ryan talks about the implementation details of the memory arena though. I was barely able to follow along without myself, so uh, it was just tricky without a visual explanation since this is a audio only podcast. So feel free to skip over that a bit if you like. Uh, we've got some really juicy telescope stuff after that, uh, so stick around if you're interested. Also, real quick before we get started, if you have any questions that come up throughout the podcast that are not answered uh, and you would like to have them answered, then I'll leave a link down in the description. Uh, if you're watching this on Spotify, watching, listening on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or anything, it should be in the description note on the podcast thing. Yeah, so go follow that link. You can upvote your questions or uh, ask them. And in the next podcast that I do with Ryan, I will go over them and should get them answered for you. So yeah, without further ado, I hope you enjoy the combo. I guess so we can like kick things off just like at the beginning programming, mm -hmm. you know, because I mean, I remember stumbling across you a while back and I was just pretty stunned. Like, I thought you were just an absolute madman doing all this <laughs> stuff from scratch and see. And uh, your way of programming, like, it's, it's, it's really quite unique. So, um, I've been trying to think of a way to categorize it. And, mm -hmm. I mean, I've kind of made the mistake of calling it data-oriented in the past, but it's not entirely data-oriented. Um, it's not functional. Uh, I know C is a procedural language, so... Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's definitely a bunch of buzzwords that we can throw around here, but uh, how do you think you would define your way of programming? Huh. Um, so I, uh, it's kind of interesting because I've taken a lot of different ideas from various sources. Um, so uh, even though I, I don't consider what I do functional programming, it's true that there are functional programming ideas that have made their way into my style. Um, and obviously there's just old school sort of straightforward procedural code that you write, which isn't necessarily data oriented programming either. Um, I think, I don't know, it's, it's, I haven't thought of a word for it, but because often what I consider myself to be doing is not actually low level programming, despite the fact that I feel like for a lot of things I do, there has to be some familiarity with the underlying system, but not to the degree that a lot of people expect. I actually, I actually feel like I'm doing high-level programming a, uh, a lot of the time, even if it's in C. And part of that is, I think, over time I, I had to learn how to build my own abstractions because existing abstractions were inadequate for various reasons, including technical reasons. So, um, and I think learning to build abstractions does require thinking about the lower levels as well. And um, so I don't know, I, I see it as a ping pong, I guess, between, you know, sometimes you have to dive down, consider like sort of lower level details. Sometimes you um, will sort of use what you've built and ping pong back up to like high level programming where you uh, can sort of be confident that you've set things up correctly. Um, and I, it's, yeah, it's really hard to say. I think these days what I would say is uh, a lot of my programming is built around like thinking about high level data transformations. Like when I'm doing programming, I'm not actually thinking about, um, like 
directly each instruction that the CPU is doing, but it's more so uh, what information am I starting with and what does that look like? How is that structured? And where am I pushing that information towards? Like what am I, how am I transforming it to get it into a different spot where it could be more useful to me in some way? Maybe I'm adding information or removing it or just restructuring it in some way. Um, so that I mean that shows yeah. up in a lot of in a lot of cases. It's it's kind of that is kind of a mathematical idea. Like it's sort of it's sort of uh, like related to category theory. Or even though I don't consider myself well versed in category theory at all, um, it it is related to the idea of like t uh, types. But those types are also grounded in like their lower lower level representation. Um, so I don't know. I mean, it's I, I I hate to leave you hanging with a label that I could put on it, but um, yeah. No, I mean, I th I think that's kind of the beauty of you is that you don't really, like, you don't want to kind of like narrow yourself into one specific label because all these different types of programming they all have their own kind of pros and cons and different ways of doing things and they're all kind of just a bunch of tools that you can use and kind of grab and mush together into a hodgepodge of ideas so right um yeah i think it's yeah, a, I mean, you just grab everything from all the different styles i guess yeah i i think it's a mistake for people to be attached to one specific label that they care about uh so if people are really on board with like the functional programming train um, even if there are some useful ideas from that sort of school of thought, um, I think people can take it too far and they become sort of uh, religious about something that's totally detached from their actual requirements when they're trying to produce a program. Um, but of course, yeah, there are, there are fruitful ideas that have come from functional programming that I use in my day-to-day -day, like programming style. But I think it's I think it's a big mistake for people to get attached to like oh I'm a procedural programmer or I'm an object oriented programmer or a functional programmer, um, or you know especially getting attached to programming languages I think is a huge mistake. Instead, it's like you want to be able to prioritize your original goal of of building the program that you set out to build and whatever tools you encounter along the way that help you do certain parts of that problem a little bit easier. You should that should be the principle you 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 know, the, that you stand by not getting attached to labels and thinking that was the point um, at the beginning. Mm, gotcha. Yeah. Um, speaking of uh, object oriented, like I've been yeah. thinking about this for a while now. And I mean, because there's no object oriented in C really. So we're kind of just cut off there. But if you could make kind of like a, uh, like a case for object oriented programming, and kind of like the good aspects of it and kind of where it can kind of go a little bit wrong as well. Um, mm -hmm. What do you think the... So I would actually, so I would start by saying that object-oriented programming, like before everyone always talks about this subject and I think the big mistake they make immediately is they don't define their terms because object-oriented programming means a lot of different things to a lot of people. So it could mean like a set of yeah. features inside of a programming language. Um, and I, and th when you consider it from that angle, it's true that like C is not an object-oriented language, but you can do what I would consider to be object-oriented programming inside of C. Um, you can even do it at the assembly okay. level. And that's primarily because the way that I think of object-oriented programming, having been exposed to it in an academic setting and obviously in lots of online discussions, is uh, it's a mental thought process. Um, it's, it's like a paradigm, obviously like called a programming paradigm, that's about considering code in a certain way. And that is primarily by sort of uh, using a high-level model of what your problem is and dividing that up into... Um, into like high level object concepts and objects are obviously bundles of code and data and um, uh, I think that is the process that I tend to take issue with um, generally speaking I think that there's it's definitely true that y you can imagine people using object oriented features and leading to a program that isn't structured poorly it's just the mechanism by which you choose to divide things up. That's kind of the key issue, I think. And what I've generally heard from the object-oriented camp is, 
excuse me, um, what I've generally heard from that camp is, is are, are, are things that I think are bad mechanisms for coming up with like how you split concepts up, how you organize your code and data. Um, the, the primary thing that I think people talk about is considering your problem from a high level, from sort of a business logic perspective. And obviously this isn't true of all object-oriented programmers, um, th but th this is why I want to steer clear of saying object-oriented programming this is this way. It's just like how I've been presented it and how people have talked about it to me and how it was presented in an academic setting. You think about it from like a business logic perspective yeah. and that's how you div divide up your program. And I think that's wrong for a bunch of reasons. Um, but, you know, whether you choose to bundle your code and data into a class versus you know, a bundle of simple C structs and, and functions. It it's I think I, I think those language features add a lot of nonsense that's just not necessary, but it's not doing anything like that model of, of structuring things is not actually the important issue. Um, and so you see a lot of code bases that do make use of object oriented features and they do just fine. And that's not it's probably because they're thinking about the problem in a different way than business logic, like baking high level concepts about what you want the application to do into the type system and trying to organize things that way. Um, so I think it really depends on what you're like, which side of it you want to approach it from. But I think that ultimately my, my opinion on um, like how you're, how you decide to modularize things or how you uh, decide to cut things up or divide problems up is much less related to the high level business logic idea than people maybe would expect initially. And that's because it stems from the most effective way I've found to devise things like that is to start from basically the bottom up. So you want to consider actually what the computer has to do, like from a machine perspective, not assembly instructions. And this relates back to what I was saying about my programming style, where it's, it is really related to high level ideas about data transformations. So it's not, it's not like high level, like business logic, like abstract, like, you know, I don't, I don't really know what how exactly to classify it. What do you mean it, by a high level business logic? So um, when you see like, I guess a really simple, probably overused example is, uh, it's, I'm trying to think back to like academic, examples that I was presented with, but, uh, you know, like if you're building a system that manages data about employees, for example, or managers, um, then the high level business logic approach would be to take every high level noun that you're considering in your system. And then that would imply the existence of a class and some related code. And, um, to sort of consider things from that perspective and to also consider each one of those classes as a possible actor, like as a, as something within the system that has arbitrary decision-making power. Um, and that sort of comes with the territory because it's, it's a, like the class is not just simple data or anything like that. It's, it's this complicated object that you send, it obviously originally stems from the idea of sending messages or receiving messages from that object. And um, that, in a sense, is not necessarily the most broken model, like the message passing stuff. But it uh, it's erroneous to start from the high level business logic stuff, which is, yeah, hopefully that clears it up, where you have these nouns in your high level problem, like somewhat a project manager who doesn't know programming comes to you and says, you know, we need the system to manage, uh, you know, time cards of employees. And so you go to the problem, you sit down and you say, okay, and we need to spec out all the nouns here. Let's make a UML diagram of like, we need a class for the, for the timesheets. That's like one high level concept that we want to be able to talk about. We also need a class for the employee and for managers. And then, then you start thinking about relationships between types. It's like, well, you know, the manager is also an employee. So like maybe there's just a super class employee and they both inherit from that. Um, I mean, you, it's it's just, it's very unrelated and divorced from the problem itself, which is what does the computer have to do to, to usefully transform data that you have into data that you need? And um, that's, I guess that's what I would say about that. 
Gotcha. All right, yeah, it's it's very interesting. I mean, we probably should have prefaced this uh, this part with uh, the fact that this is going to be like a little bit of a bit more of a technical talk. I mean, especially at that beginning, trying to define all the programming terms. But it's very <laughs> interesting. Uh, I mean, you're coming from an ap- um, from an academic perspective. I mean, you've uh, you've graduated by now, haven't you? Right. Yep. Yeah. So, I mean, and I'm really just a monkey who's been thrown at Google. So, I mean, it's, <laughs> it, it's taken me a while to, I guess, kind of figure out all these terms. Uh, and I mean, still now, uh, probably about 10% of what you just said actually got through to me. So it's going to be pretty interesting <laughs> just, re, just re-listening to this to trying to figure out what the hell you're trying to get out here. But yeah, yeah, yeah I mean, uh, it. It definitely does make sense uh, to an extent. Uh, I mean, especially like that high level business logic stuff um, that it's kind of like it is a natural way of us categorizing things. I mean, that's just what we do. I think that's a lot of what um, a little bit of what category theory, category theory comes into play with. But it's like it's it's a very natural process of us like labeling things like nouns like oh, this guy's an employee manager, blah, blah, blah. And then maybe designing an entire system around that. Uh, but the problem that I've run into over and over again with trying to do that in um, when when writing code, be it like just a, I mean, I tried making a game engine a while back. Uh, I did a bunch of stuff in C++ when I was using Unreal Engine. Yeah, uh, It's very tricky to, like say you have a given piece of data, you then have to put that in the right class. And then it's like, oh, well, what if, I also want that in this other class. And it's like, I feel like I spend more time trying to figure out how to structure my program than actually programming itself. Um, and I think that's kind of the issue that I run into with object oriented. Uh, and that's kind of its biggest uh, contention point for me. But I don't know if that's just a bit of a beginner mindset on, or not. Or yeah, I think that's I uh, that that matches my experience when I was kind of being exposed to those ideas um, in both academic settings and also when I saw it in uh, industry. It was sort of like each class is is correlated with a high level idea as opposed to a um, sort sort of a necessary um, data transformation lower level. Um, idea. So it's very, basically what happens is that initially when someone sets up an object oriented system, they have a high level model of the problem in their head and they bake that into the type system by making classes. uh, And those classes correspond with sort of nodes in their, in their internal mental model graph of the problem kind of. And, um, what they end up doing is implementing functions in those classes to sort of map that high level model down onto the necessary low level reality, which is what the hardware has to do. And there is some mapping there. Like there, there's some mapping between their high level model and what the computer has to end up doing, like the actual instructions uh, and uh, everything actually happening on the low level. There's some mapping there, but what's, uh, difficult about it is that that model is not well defined for a given problem. So for some given data transformation that you need to happen, you could invent potentially several high level models for it. And as a result of that, many individuals will have many different competing models for the same thing, uh, for, for like the, the yeah. high level model that maps down to the lower level reality of the problem. So what happens when you go into like a high level object oriented code base is before you even start thinking about the lower level transformations that you'd like to happen, you have to start interpreting their high level model. Well, first you have to take your high level model of the problem and you sort of have to correct it. You have to bake that down in your head to the low level reality of the problem. Then you have to like reverse project it back onto their model. And then you can sort of start understanding how their model works and then you can start adjusting your model to sort of fit theirs and it's a very expensive process i think so when people say that object-oriented programming is actually better for understandability or better for readability or better for maintaining code i actually think that's just wrong it seems like it's a more expensive process to do that sort of 
high level model readjustment and reinterpretation over time. Um, so that's why I think it's just a lot better to start from, here's what the CPU has to do. Uh, you know, here are our constraints about code reuse and um, we'd like to isolate this layer of code so that we can call into it without depending on these other things in the code. Uh, you know, th there's practical constraints that start narrowing down the space of which, you know, which modularization you want for your code. Um, and I think starting from that more grounded level is, is much, it's a much more useful place to start and it, it, it tends to avoid the confusing problems where people just have these mental models about what the problem means and what it is. And uh, when you join a team, you sort of have to say like, okay, well, what were they thinking when they were talking about this? Um, because I know that the low level problem is to, you know, page an assets off disk and uh, have them ready for the game's level to use so I can render things on screen, like with the appropriate graphics, but you don't want to load in all of the assets that the entire game needs all at once or something like that. Like, you know, sort of the shape of the problem from a, from the, it's again, it's not low level. So it's really hard for me to, I don't want to use that term. It's just more like data transformation perspective. Just like, what are the types we start with? What are the types that we need? You know, we have an asset file on disk. We need to take that type quote unquote to, or that, that data structure to a runtime appropriate structure we have to be able to page things off disk and you can sort of have a model of the low level oh, there i go again with that word but you can sort of have a model of the problem in that way and then if someone is coming up with like these ideas on top of that like well we'll, well we have these asset managers and those are templatized on the type of the asset and um they all have to work in these different ways so it's like a class hierarchy at the same at the same time or like i don't really know it can get pretty crazy but mm. i think um yeah we're yeah. We probably should have started off with this, uh, but uh, <laughs> how would you define the low level versus high level? Like when, when I was first starting out and I heard people throwing that idea around, I was like, what the hell is going on here? I have no idea what this means. Yeah, I think, well, so I, I think from a, it's, it's, th those are also difficult terms. You can see I was just kind of stumbling over myself trying to not yeah. use low level to mean something that I didn't mean for it to. Um, so, but I, I guess the traditional sense of the word is is basically how abstracted you are from the hardware. So, um, an example yeah. of very low level programming would be uh, it, it, nowadays it's actually not that low level. But <laughs> imagine if you're directly encoding assembly instructions, even if it's you know into text, which is still an abstracted model. Um, but you know you're writing assembly code that's a lower yep. level model of programming than C programming is. And that's partly because there's like a greater transformation that has to happen between what you're writing and what actually has to end up running on the hardware. So in the case of assembly, yep. you're writing text and then you use a program called an assembler to turn that into you know, the architecture encoding for the instruction set architecture. So, um, you know, you parse the text, you say, oh, they're, they're trying to use the mov instruction or the add instruction uh, because you're reading the text and you see the characters they typed. And then you say, oh, well, we know how to encode. The assembler is the thing that says, I know how to encode that text or I know how to take, interpret the text that someone has typed, uh, know what instruction they're referring to inside of the instruction set architecture and then encode that appropriately in a way that the CPU is built to understand. Um, but if you think about programming in C, you've added a whole other pipeline above that, which is not only, I mean, you're not going to produce text generally, like you're not producing text assembly, but um, if you just think about the problem of encoding instructions in the instruction set architecture, you've added a whole other pipeline on top of that where the C programming language has like high level concepts about, it has a type system, it has uh, control flow ideas and, and ideas about functions and, um, so if you think about the problem of a C compiler, it has to do the problem of instruction encoding eventually. But before that, it has to do like, okay, how do we parse this text into an abstract syntax tree? And then we need to type check that syntax tree and then do all these various semantic checks. And, and we need to produce probably intermediate representation at some point. And um, like after a very long, many of many stages, you get to the, the final thing, which is, you know, producing instructions encoded into like what the CPU expects. And um, 
I think that's partly what is meant by high level versus low level. It's it's how many steps are there to get from what you're encoding to the final reality of the problem. Um, not a perfect definition, yep. but that's maybe one thing to shed some light on on that kind of gradient or that spectrum. Right. Gotcha. So could we say something like assembly C, C++ on top of C, <laughs> and then maybe a engine on top of C++, like Unreal Engine, uh, would that be a decent kind of like low to high? Um, yeah, I would say so. It, it it's hard to it's hard to categorize C++ because C++ is not just one language. Mm, yeah. It's it's like a thousand, and people use it in crazy ways, and sometimes people use it reasonably. Um, so it's you know it really depends on what you're doing. It could be at the same level as C. Um, it could also be way more abstract. Um, and you can also do really abstract stuff in C, That's but true, yeah. obviously once you go into like browser languages like JavaScript, then it's like much further from the hardware um, because you're working inside of the abstract model of the JavaScript language. And what that gets turned into is actually not even assembly instructions. It gets turned into, um, it's like JIT compiled into bytecode that a JavaScript engine can interpret. And that engine is the thing doing the final transformation into native instructions. So it's it's sort of even more removed. There's also other things like, there's other problems tangled up in this. Like I said, it's not a perfect definition. Generally, people would consider garbage collection to be a higher level concept. Um, and that doesn't exactly match with the definition. Maybe it does in some way that I'm not thinking about, but... Um, you know, there's like, I guess what you could say is that there's more invisible stuff happening. Uh, there's there's extra stuff that has to happen to, like, behind the scenes to, to manage exactly what ends up happening. But, um, yeah, but other uh, other than the weird C++, like, the fact of C++ being a weird language, uh, with itself being a thousand different things, I think that what you said was correct. It's It's... You know, if you're writing handwriting assembly, that's pretty low level. Still not the lowest level. Like the lowest level would be, you know, um, like circuitry design or something. Or you could probably even make an argument that like even that is an abstraction over like positioning atoms or something. I don't know. Um, <laughs> at the extremes, it, at the extremes, it becomes like not that interesting of a discussion. <laughs> but um, or maybe yeah. it does. I don't know. But for the pr for the purposes of programming, it's like. Sure, like <laughs> circuitry design, or like actually physically forming circuitry, writing assembly, um, uh, writing C slash C++, maybe, maybe higher level C++ is above that. And then, yeah, obviously you get to like blueprints or uh, positioning objects in a, and like setting properties on them inside of a level editor. Um, I would say that that's like a generally accepted ordering, I would say, like most people would probably agree with that 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 is sort of low to high yeah. what it looks like gotcha all righty going back to garbage collection uh so from someone mm -hmm. coming from a language like c sharp java uh they've probably heard of the term but may not even really know exactly what's going on there uh right so could you explain a bit about garbage collection about how like c c plus plus uh i guess kind of lacks it and how i guess we can solve that issue because i feel like that's the uh, the scariest thing about making the jump down into C or C++ is yeah. the lack of garbage collection. You have to actually manage your own memory. Uh, yeah. So for someone who kind of is looking to get down there with uh, minimal hassle in that kind of transition, um, how would you kind of define garbage collection and uh, all that kind of good stuff? Yeah, for sure. Um, so uh, I, I guess... The most useful way I can probably try to explain this is starting, ironically, starting from something like a lower level idea of what memory usage on a computer looks like. But um, I, I can start there and try to try to explain how the garbage collector is doing that behind the scenes, I, I guess. So uh, yeah. general okay. idea is like if you're writing C code or if you're writing any sort of code that does like does not have a garbage collector on it you have the problem of needing to grab memory um somehow you know you need storage for certain things you need to store um 
like uh, three dimensional coordinates for every entity in your game. Um, you need to store uh, like various things like that, and event in you know that requires memory, and <clears throat> so you have um, you have some way of like. Oh, sorry, I gotta clear my throat. Um, All right. So, uh, you, uh, anyways, you have the problem of needing to obtain some memory to actually encode the bits, ultimately, that correlate with whatever state you're trying to store. So, you you know, you have, oh, I need an X, Y, and Z coordinate for every entity in my game. That will go into this block of memory along with all of the other entity data or something like that. And the... the then there comes a problem, which is um, you have a mechanism for obtaining memory, right? It's it's in C. It's it's the function malloc people think of because that's in the C runtime library. Uh, in C plus plus, you call the you use the new operator, and in languages like C sharp, I don't write C sharp, so you know might have to correct me, but you might call new uh, the use the new operator there. I think I think they have the new operator as well there, and um, yeah, that's like yeah, the equivalent. That gets used a couple times. Right, so the high level idea of this that someone who's writing in C-sharp, for example, would be familiar with is that the, like instantiating an object is an equivalent of saying, I need memory for some state and I'm asking you the programming language when you're writing the new operator or whatever, this is the spot in the program where I am asking you to retrieve that memory for me. In C, what you also have to do, for example, or I mean, uh, you, we'll get into it, but uh, you know it, you can easily yeah, yeah. see how <laughs> you can easily see how if you are able to obtain memory, then what happens when you no longer need that memory, right? You, um, you you that state doesn't need to last for the entire duration of the program or anything. You just need it for a temporary period. Like if we're still talking about entities in a game, it might be for as long as this map is loaded. I need this memory for this entity or whatever. Uh, so in C, there's yeah. also uh, there's the malloc API for getting stuff in the C runtime library. There's also the free API, and the free API is is just specifying to the implementation of this allocator that they've written. It's just saying the memory that I previously reserved for you know I, I called malloc, I got a pointer back, and a pointer is just an address. Um, the memory at that address is now released which doesn't necessarily mean that it's not being used anymore. It just means, uh, hey, allocator, put like uh, let it be known that this memory is no longer being used by me. So if someone else calls malloc, they can get the same address back. Um, and then they can start using that memory for their purposes. And so that's like what you have to do in C. Now, when you're writing in something like JavaScript, C Sharp, or something like that, you can call new, like it's kind of all managed behind the scenes for you. And in the case of JavaScript or C Sharp, this is done, or Java, this is done with uh, a garbage collector. Now a garbage collector, its whole job is to know when certain, it's, it's not pointers, because there are like, you're not working with pointers in those languages. The whole problem is to know when certain blocks of memory that have been reserved every time you call new, or every time you instantiate an object, its job is to know when those blocks of memory that were used for those purposes are no longer being used by anything, and then to do the sort of cleanup of those automatically behind the scenes. And yep. um, I don't, I won't go, I, I I won't go into the details of the algorithm because I'm not, I I don't work in garbage collected languages, so I don't have a really good familiarity with like literally how they do that. Um, but yeah, yeah. Uh, that's the general idea is uh, it's it's you know okay we have all these objects allocated how are we going to know which ones are currently being used they're referenced by something or uh or they're not or they're totally just like free floating no one's talking about them anymore if that happens then we can say okay then we can free that automatically for the for the user so the user meaning the person programming never had to write a free call they never had to call, or in C++, the equivalent to free would be like the delete operator. Uh, they never had to do that, but then there's this automatic system behind the scenes that's running 
sort of alongside the program that's keeping track of these objects and their instantiations and which ones are pointing to which other ones. And it will say, I see this one is no longer being referenced by anything, so we can take that out. Um, and that's kind of, that's the general idea of a garbage collector. Um, it's doing sort of all that right, stuff. So it just basically right. automates, it just automates the freeing process. Whereas in a language like C, you would have to manually call that yourself. So I guess it kind of saves you from having to keep track of, uh, I guess the lifetime, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's a bit of a tricky definition, but it's, it, it, it just saves you from having to keep track of whether or not you have to free this specific variable, right? So say right. you declare an integer in, the, in some certain scope of a function, right? You don't have to worry about getting rid of that integer. It just kind of just does that um, for you. I mean, I, actually, no, that's, that's, that's a bad example because same thing happens in C. But like from the case <laughs> of you actually allocating memory with, uh, with new, you don't have to worry about then grabbing that memory and then actually freeing that as well. Right, um, and that's the, the, that's the pitch at least. So oftentimes you'll hear stories yeah. of people who wrote games in Unity, for example, or Java, and they sort of had to figure out how to game the garbage collector to not, for performance reasons or uh, for leaks, there are still memory leaks inside of a garbage collector um, or even if you're using a garbage collector, there, there, uh, it's, it's not like literally a leak in the sense of there's no way th that you can get back to whatever memory um, is being like quote unquote leaked. But it's a leak in the sense of you thought you weren't using this memory anymore, but something in your code is still keeping track of it through some indirect mechanism somehow. Yep. And so that memory accumulates over time and then you effectively have a leak. So what happens, and there's also the performance problem of this garbage collector is not a cheap process. It's a very complicated system that's needing to do the management of, you know, which objects are being referenced, which ones aren't, and, and how do we know whether something is able to be freed or not. Um, and there are, there are problems in like games where people will be hitting like frame hitches, for example, if they're being hit by the garbage collector. So you'll see a lot of people have these stories of having to understand the lower level details of how the garbage collector is actually working to avoid hitting those hitches at certain times. Um, mm. And so it's actually, you don't, that's the pitch of garbage collectors and it works in a lot of cases. Um, but I think at the limit in very complicated projects, you actually run into issues with it still. You kind of have to be more familiar yeah, with the system. Yeah. Doesn't mean you shouldn't use it, but th that's definitely something that happens. Um, so uh, now mm. in C++, the so I should go back to like the C model. So there's like malloc and free, and uh, C++ looked at that and said, "Well, it's kind of annoying." Actually, I should I should first specify like you mentioned the integer thing in C. I should explain what that is too for someone who's familiar with like C sharp and JavaScript kind of programming. Um, <clears throat> so there's two kind of parallel like there are the two concepts in. Um, in C programming or systems programming that people will mention a lot called the stack and the heap. And the heap is what you are working with when you use one of these like dynamic memory allocation ideas like malloc and free. You call malloc, that's considered a heap allocation. Um, so when you, when you call malloc, you're doing a heap allocation and it's, it's called dynamic allocation because you are dynamically asking at runtime, you're like, when you wrote the code, you didn't know how many bytes you needed, for example, or maybe you did, but in, you called malloc anyways, and you said, um, you know, I, I like dynamically at runtime, I just need like 1,024 bytes. Like that's, I just need that for this state that I plan to store. That's like heap allocation. Then there's this other concept of stack allocation, which is sort of bound to uh, like a scope-based lifetimes inside of C. And um, so for example, if you just wrote like int x in C, you have storage for that integer, but that doesn't go through dynamic allocation. That's not actually calling malloc behind the scenes or something. In other languages, it might. So in JavaScript, for example, if you did var x equals something that might actually cause like the same path that would have happened as like a complicated dynamic object allocation would have. 
Um, but in C, if you just wrote int x, that's actually not doing that. What Instead, what happens is there's, there's this block of memory that's pre-reserved um, at the beginning of the program called the stack. And the stack is allocated and deallocated from in a very specific way. Basically, what happens is anytime you're in a function, you're just in a block of code and it's, it's like you enter into the function sort of. And whenever that happens, there's some amount of memory that that function needs to use for stuff that's been declared to be on the stack. So that int x would be like, you know, 32 bits or eight or uh, four bytes. And the compiler looked at that and said, okay, this scope, the first thing it's going to do is, is push four bytes onto the stack. It just, ne I need four bytes for this integer. And this is, this is very high level. I'm skipping a lot of details. It might be more than four bytes. It might be, um, yeah. or it might store that int into a register, for example. So you might not get a stack allocation at all, but at the high level, you have uh, like stack allocation there. So you said int x, and what that said is that when this function enters, first we save the value of the stack, like the, the top, the address at the top of the stack before we enter or before we start pushing stuff on for this function, we'll save that somewhere. And then, then we will push some stuff onto the stack. And what that means is basically just moving a pointer. It's just saying like, the top of the stack is going to be moved four bytes down so that next time we need to push something onto the stack, it'll go below those four bytes that we reserve for that integer. It's hard to do this without like a visual representation, but I'm, I'm hopefully getting it. Yeah, we need like a whiteboard to just be drawing on. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. But ho hopefully it's still coming across. But, um, and then what happens at the end of the function is it just says, oh, grab that original stack value, and I'm just gonna use that at the top of the stack now. So then it, then it um, sort of subtracts, or depends on which direction the stack is going, but then it'll just reset, it'll kind of move back the top of the stack to before uh, the spot where those four bytes were placed. So inside of the scope of the function, you have memory for that X coming from the stack memory, but then at the end of the function scope, or or this could be like any scope that you're in, at the end of that scope, that memory will be sort of eligible for reuse by by something else that wants to allocate from the stack. So, um, yep. you know, if you enter into a function, you say int X, let's, you know, again, that might go into a register, might not, depends but uh let's say it goes onto the stack and you say okay there's four four bytes on the stack for this integer and then you like add a hundred to it five times or whatever and then you exit the scope and then you go into another scope where someone also says int x uh that x will probably be at the same spot in memory ultimately so even though it's a different variable because the lifetimes don't overlap they're in different scopes um, you can sort of assume that it's like, oh, well, we can just reuse this memory that's been popped off the stack at this point. So, um, as a result, you don't need to write, like, you don't write the pops of the stack yourself. This is something that happens behind the yeah. scenes. It's sort of like garbage collection, except it's locked to this specific scope-based model of kind of hierarchical lifetimes where you just have here's this function, this function calls into this other function, so that's a sub-lifetime now. But we know for sure that at the end, like uh, you can sort of see how um, it's like the easiest garbage collection problem you could possibly have because you can lock things into these scopes. Dynamic allocation becomes more necessary when you don't have such a clean hierarchical model. Um, and instead you have to do some lifetime management yourself uh, for... Yep or you use a garbage collector to do it basically, where it's not so clean cut like that. Um, but that's what the stack is for. It's for the very easy common case of simple hierarchical lifetimes. And as a result, you kind of get like quote unquote garbage collection for free um, because all yeah. you're doing is moving a pointer. It's, it's very automated. To... You, don't, you don't have to worry about the, uh, the memory there. You kind of just program right. and you go. Yep. Gotcha, Alrighty. Cool. All right. So, um, yeah. All right. Well, this is a, uh, it's tricky because it's like, I don't really want to assume that everyone knows, uh, what all these things are, but at the same time, I don't I really don't want to spend all day just diving into every single yeah. possible definition. Uh, cause I mm -hmm. think, you know, we can kind of assume that, uh, people do kind of know what these things are, but going back to garbage collection, 
Uh, how have yeah. you solved this? The Ryan Fleury way, trademark <laughs> pending, uh, <laughs> NC. And uh, how have you kind of made C a little bit less uh, pointy for, uh, <laughs> for people to come in and use? <laughs> yeah, so I, I should first clarify that, um, you know, if, if people start calling it the Ryan Fleury way, I certainly won't be mad. Yeah, true. I'm just, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but um, I'm just kidding. It, it, I don't want to make it sound like it's an original idea uh, because I benefited very much from Handmade Hero and the Handmade community who kind of, as, as a community and as like a separate sort of circle of people, iterated on these ideas for a long time. And uh, it's sort of that where I got all this knowledge from. It's not necessarily me just being really smart about memory allocators or something. Uh, so every idea that I'm putting out there now is like not mine. It's it's stuff I've learned. So I'm here as someone to share the information, not to uh, claim it as my own. But I think it's definitely true that- The messenger. Right, exactly. Like just consider me the messenger of, of what I'll talk about. Um, but it's definitely true that I would say is that a lot of people writing C don't really program in this way. Um, it's something that I've noticed to be very localized to the sort of handmade circles. Um, and also some right, like, and games. And when we say handmade, uh, so we've got, all right, so we've got Handmade Hero, that's being made by Casey, uh, and he's done a right. awesome job of kind of, it's a very educational series um, for, I guess programming in C, or he, he, he doesn't see plus plus, but pro, but programming in, I guess we could call this the handmade way. Yeah. Um, uh, and then so we've got the handmade uh, community on top of that, uh, and that's something that you're pretty involved with. Right. Uh, so yeah, there's a there's a couple different handmaids here, but in general, what would you kind of, I guess that's how we could term your programming style uh, is kind of like in the handmade way. Yeah, I, um, it's handmade also means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. So I don't mm, want to, yeah, that's it's, it's hard to say, but I would say that definitely um, if you were looking to just scientifically categorize things just strictly from observation, my programming style will be much closer to many of the programming styles you find in the handmade community than pretty much anywhere else as far as I know. Um, so that's a very good like correlating metric is like, did it come from, ha from the handmade community or, or adjacent to that, or did it not? And yep. uh, that's, a, that's a pretty useful categorization, even if a lot of people would be like, well, that's not what handmade means or whatever. It's like, whatever, forget about it. That's a useful circle. Of, of like it's a useful observational uh, category that you can use um, so yeah, yeah. Right, um, back to garbage collection right so um, so basically the way that this becomes a lot easier in C uh, well let me first let me explain how it's hard like the way that people um, do it most of the time just becomes very difficult. Uh, at some point, I don't know the history here, but there's a lot of C programming that goes on where people are doing sort of object-oriented style thinking, where they're like, this object is entirely independent. It's like a decentralized little piece of my program. And as a result, I don't want to, like th the thought process of bucketing it in with other th concepts in the system, is like totally not in the thought process at all. It's like, this is my object. It manages these things or whatever. And uh, it's like this independent thing that I can instantiate or de-instantiate. And uh, that kind of model of thinking led to this pattern of mallocking and freeing like every single little object, basically. Now it's not literally everything because eventually you have to stop. Like eventually you have to say, okay, this is just a struct I'm instantiating and has these integers in it or something. And then I'll stop there. I'm not going to dynamically allocate the integers too. Um, but generally at the, at the granularity of these high level object type ideas, you would have like people uh, just saying like, okay, this is a object that you can alloc or free. 
and under the hood that would be you know malloking uh, some memory for that thing and then filling out the initial values and then the release part of that would be okay free this back or free this free this object now uh, and so that becomes pretty complicated because generally when people do that for every conceptual object in their system you have sort of this rat's nest of of objects and lifetimes start to develop and as a result when you mm, when you yeah. want to do something very common in your program like unload this level because we're about to load a new one you can't simply just say okay free all the memory associated with this level you can't do that anymore because every single piece of memory that's sort of been allocated for that level has gone through like this generic malloc call so instead of just saying, okay, release like a, an entire block of all the memory for this level, instead what you have to do is say, oh, okay, like go free all the entities. And for each, for each entity, we actually have to look at what they dynamically allocated. And then so free all of that. And then uh, there's like a bunch of collision information that we have to dynamically free. Oh, we, we dynamically allocated vertices for the collision shapes. Uh, so we have to go free those, those dynamic arrays of vertices or whatever. And you end up in this rat's nest of lifetimes. And sometimes that can be a really frustrating process because um, A, it can be hard to keep track of, so it's very easy to produce leaks accidentally. Uh, B, it's also just a lot of extra work. Like you don't, this is like supposed to be the easy thing of like closing down this level. It's not, it's not an exciting feature you wanna be working on. It's like, oh, I just have to clean up <laughs> after myself and I've created this big mess. Um, so it, it's just, it ends up being a really frustrating process um, and one that's very bug prone. You can have crashes because you freed something that something else is depending on. And then so, you know, you whenever you try to free the thing that was depending on the thing you already freed, it'll try to like dereference some memory that's been released already and that'll cause your program to crash or whatever. Uh, so you can sort of step on like these overlapping just lifetime Just a quick controls. side note. I I think yeah. this was literally the way in which I got completely derailed out of my own engine was this exact issue of like, right. Yeah. I just, it, it, it just came to the point where I was newing and deleting so many times that there were just so many random little bugs. And I was just like, this is an absolute mess that there's got to be a better way. Um, right. But yeah. Yep. So continue. Yeah, totally. So, um, I also ran into the same problem for like many years myself as well. Um, and yeah, it, it turns into this this crazy problem of like, it's bug prone, it's slow, um, because you're having like, freeing all this stuff is not trivial. You have to actually have to walk all of the entities that you dynamically allocated and then uh, do the free calls uh, for everything they allocated. It's just complicated, it's slow, it's bug prone, it's error prone. It's a lot of mess. Or bug and error is maybe the same thing. Uh, so bug prone, uh, very <laughs> slow, uh, very difficult to get right, takes a lot of time to manage, uh, very easy to get out of sync with like your allocation. It's very easy to be implementing a feature and being like, oh, I just need to allocate something there, I'll free it in a second. And then like you get off on a side track and then like you forget to add the free thing and then you don't realize until like several months later and you're like, yeah. oh shit, like I really wish I realized where I made this allocation. So then obviously people have tools for this, like uh, like Valgrind will, uh, it'll like intercept your malloc and free calls and like try to figure out like what's been allocated, what's been freed, and it can do a pretty good job at that kind of thing. Um, but it, it, it's it's just a nightmare. And um, yeah. So that's actually where- So like, let's RAII, clean up that nightmare. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's where RAII, comes in where like a lot of people in C++ they're like, why would I ever want to program in C? Because C++ lets me automate that process, right? The idea, there's a, yep. there's this idea of, of destructors in C++ where it's like each one of those dynamically allocated objects will have a destructor that runs. It's just a, it's like an invisible function that runs whenever this uh, thing goes out of scope, basically. Or whenever this lifetime ends is probably the more correct. Uh, terminology and so people when they would implement a class would say okay here's my constructor I dynamically allocate those things and then I have a destructor where I free those things and yep. that'll just run anytime I instantiate one of these objects this piece of code will will, will run and it'll free everything 
Now, obviously, you can run into this, some of the same problems of, like, um, you know, uh, like, uh, you, you mismanaging, you're, you're managing both initialization and deinitialization. Um, it can sort of still turn into a mess, but, for example, if, if one mm. of your objects... But on on the surface, it does seem a bit better than the alternative, right. though. Yeah, because like if you resource have resource acquisition is initialization. Is that R A I I? Yeah, yeah. So, um, I'm sure some C plus plus people would probably take issue with like how I'm presenting it or whatever. But, uh, but yeah, if you if you were to use um, like another R A I I object inside of your class that you're implementing, that would also like you wouldn't have to write deallocation code for that either. So, um, if you had like an STD vector inside of your entity. Uh, you wouldn't have to call the destructor of the std vector or something that would also run um when your object goes out of scope as well or when it, when its lifetime ends mm. i should say so uh, anyways that's where that idea comes from and it makes it easier on the surface but you still have this very complicated process happening under the hood so you still have the possibility that you're going to run into a lot of bugs you still have all the performance problems you're actually not saving anything there um, and basically the handmade community, I shouldn't say the handmade community cause it was really Casey who was looking at this problem and I'm sure he got his ideas from like people in the game industry and, um, everything like that. But when they were considering this problem, they being vague because I don't know who, but someone who influenced Casey or Casey <laughs> probably helped iterate on it. I don't want to speak for any of them, but my understanding is they were looking at this problem and, and it's it's just, it seems like a silly problem to solve, right? It's like, well, we have this mess of things that we created and we would like to not have that mess anymore. So really what we need to do is automate the cleaning up of that mess. And it seems like kind of ridiculous at the end of the day, because you think about that and you go, why did you create the mess in the first place? Like, why did you not just simplify your requirements <laughs> and uh, like not have this crazy... Uh, automated cleanup process that has to happen instead just don't make the mess in the first place and so handmade hero very much coming from that sort of like uh, from that style of thinking introduced this idea of an arena allocator now this is not originate like this this is not a handmade hero original allocator like because of it might be handmade hero original terminology um, but fundamentally, what an arena allocator is, is a linear allocator. And a linear allocator is a remarkably simple allocator that anyone could implement. Um, even in, like, you could even implement, like, an object version inside of, uh, like, JavaScript. It wouldn't really do the same kind of stuff. But um, anyways, the, the whole idea of a, of a linear allocator is that you have some... Let's start with a simple case. You pre-reserve a block of memory and you consider it all to be free at the beginning. You're like, I, I reserved 16 megabytes and that entire block is considered to not be in use. Meaning if someone asks for four megabytes, I will be able to give it to them. And the algorithm by which you give things to people when they ask for it is that you store an integer along with this block of memory that determines the the push position. And this sounds very similar to the stack thing because it's actually basically the same idea. I was idea, about to actually. say, yeah. Right, so, um, and the whole idea, you have this block of memory plus an integer. The integer starts at zero, or it could be a pointer or whatever, doesn't really matter. Uh, integer starts at zero, and then if someone asks for four megabytes, you add four megabytes to that integer, well, first you grab the the base pointer of the memory block plus whatever that integer is. So that would just be the start when when you know when you've allocated nothing. It's just like grab the beginning position of this block of memory, and then add four megabytes to that integer, and then return the pointer that you saved off. And now, next time someone asks for four megabytes, what happens? Well, then they uh, then they get the next four megabyte chunk in this big block. Uh, so you have two four megabyte allocations just occupying the first four megabyte chunks inside of this big 16 megabyte chunk that you've reserved up front. 
and then whoever allocated those things can work on them. And then there's the obvious question, well, how do you free anything? If you just have this integer, how do you free the first me uh, four megabyte chunk and not the second one? And the whole idea of the arena allocator or the linear allocator idea is that uh, that's like not the model you want to be working in actually. Like you don't want to, to consider allocations in that way. Um, an arena sort of corresponds to one lifetime. <clears throat> yeah. And uh, so what happens instead is that you, you have multiple arenas, you have multiple of these upfront uh, reservations, and then anytime you allocate something, you pick the arena that you want, knowing that it will be freed at some point. So for example, a really common example that people will bring up is that game engines, for example, will often provide the idea of a per frame arena or a per frame linear allocator or bump allocator, they're called sometimes, uh, that kind of thing. And when you're doing, when you have a per frame arena, maybe you want to do some dynamic allocation and you don't want this memory to last for a very long time. You just kind of want it to disappear without you having to think about it, much like garbage collection but you know it won't last for longer than a frame. You want to dynamically allocate a string that just needs to last until you've rendered, and then, and then after you've rendered, you don't care what happens to the memory. Then all you do is say, okay, well, I'm going to push a string, and all I have to specify is put it on the frame arena. And then you no longer have to worry about when that gets cleaned up, because at the beginning of every frame, there's just one spot where it says, okay, clear the frame arena. And by clear, it just means reset that integer back to zero. And that's it. <clears throat> yep. So so you can kind of think about it as a, it's kind of like the stack, except uh, the scope is like your, your own kind of defined scope. And you can define that scope right. in any way you kind of want. So on like right. a frame by frame basis, on the basis of you know the entire application, uh, you know it just gets allocated once, and then it's there for the rest of the allocation, um, or for the rest of the game or whatever. Uh, right. So things or, like that. Or like a uh, per map, like uh, all the memory you yep, push yep. while this map is loaded. So then you can you can also see very easily. It's like how do you free everything associated with this map? So, because I'm trying to unload this level and load a new level. So how do I free all the level memory? You just reset the level arena and that's, and, th and that's all there is to it. And yeah, it's, just, uh... yeah. And, and there's, there's only one step to that, which is set an integer to zero. So it's actually totally f free basically to do all of that. Um, and that's the, that's the general concept. Now, um, there's also other things that arise, sometimes you do want complicated lifetimes. Uh, so an arena allocator is not the only allocator you need, but what I would say is that it basically accounts for 99% of memory management that I do on a daily basis in C. Um, uh, may maybe 90%, but the I would say the 9% the of the remaining 10% is also very easy, which I'll go into now. Um, uh, and that kind of gets into the idea of using the arena as a building block for other allocators. So, um, like I said, the arena corresponds to sort of one lifetime that you set up manually, right? You reserve the memory. So you say, I need an arena and I want to reset it here. An arena can also be used like a stack. You can just keep it around forever. And then you can say, oh, well, I'm going to mark the beginning and ending points. Like I just need to do some big allocations for this function frame. So what I'll do for that is say, grab me a scratch arena at the top and then release the scratch arena at the bottom. And then I can just use that scratch arena if I have some really big dynamic stuff I have to do that only needs to be around for this function. Like you can use an arena much like a stack, but um, if it, it kind of works, you can use it either way. In fact, I think it's a false dichotomy. I think that the linear allocator sort of push a bunch of things on and then reset the whole thing is just a simple case of a stack basically. Uh, so it's just kind of like a stack allocator. And, um, but sometimes you're in like a, uh, you know, you're in circumstances where you do need to have 
complicated lifetimes on top of sort of a stable lifetime. So a really good example, also the level case. So you have a level arena and there may be like, um, there may be a requirement to have some objects or some, some like game object type things. Like you have uh, some entities in the world and um, entities are kind of a bad example because you want to iterate them all a lot. So generally you do either a sep what I tend to do is either have a separate arena for them or uh, pre-allocate like a fixed size block. Just say like, oh, I can have a maximum of this many entities because I can predict that for my for this specific game kind of thing. Um, but I mean, imagine it's something else. Uh, can't think of a really good example, but if there's something, um, it comes up all the time. Like this pattern of allocation that I'm going to get into comes up all the time. I just, I'm try I can't think of a really good example for the game uh, example right now, but... Anyways, the, the idea is that you have um, you have a stable lifetime, like uh, this level is loaded or whatever, uh, or the lifetime while this level is loaded, and you have a bunch of fixed size little like objects that you want to allocate and free independently. So this could be like the four megabyte chunk case, like how do you free the first four megabyte chunk without freeing the second one in an arena allocator? You actually still can do that, but it just doesn't happen at the layer of the arena. So the arena still thinks eight megabytes are allocated um, if you free the first megabyte chunk, four megabyte chunk. Um, with, with, and what I'm trying to describe, I'm, I'm kind of like, I, I think I'm failing to describe it appropriately, but what I'm, what I'm describing is known as a pool allocator in a lot of places. Again, terminology here is kind of fuzzy, means different things to different people, but, um, the general idea is that you have a bunch of fixed size allocations that you want independent lifetimes for, but they're sort of nested within uh, sort of like an arena style lifetime. Um, and what you can do for that is just throw a free list, what's called a free list, on top of the fixed size or on top of the arena allocation scheme. So what happens basically is um, uh, you have some structure that has the ability to point to itself. So you have a node and the first member in it is like a node star next or something like that. And uh, what that lets you do is say, uh, you can write an allocation procedure on top of an arena. Um, what, you do, what you do for the state is you have an arena as one thing in your state that's corresponding to this lifetime. And then you also have a node star and that like a pointer to a node that's the top of the free list and that just gets set to zero initially and the logic for allocating doing this pool allocation stuff is all that's saying is check if the free list is empty meaning check if it's zero or check if the top of the free list is zero so it's not pointing to anything and if that's true then push a new node onto the arena otherwise grab the top of the free list and then uh, pop that off the top of the free list. So the free list pointer moves to whatever it's pointing at next. Uh, so you sort of pop the free list, the top of the free list off, and now you have a node that you can use that you've reserved, and it can't be popped off the free list by someone else because you you popped it off right when you allocated. Or you know if you push a new node onto the arena, it's also not in the free list. So that's how you like allocate new nodes, and then if you want to release those nodes independently then you just set their next pointer to the free list top or to the top of the free list, even if that's zero. And then you set the top of the free list to that node that you're re releasing. The effect of that is, is that this node, which is uh, fixed size, it doesn't have to be fixed size. Like you can implement more complicated allocators on top of an arena too. But what this gives you the effect of is you can have an arena but on top of that arena, like sort of using that arena, you can also have dynamic lifetimes um, by independently allocating and releasing these like node structures. Now it doesn't have to be called node, it's just an example, um, but that's, that's the general idea. So you, you, when you allocate, you grab something off the free list if it's there, if not, you push a new node onto the arena. And then if there's uh, and then if you want to release, you just push whatever node you're releasing onto the onto the free list. 
Uh, and that still works with the free all case, right? Because you just release everything on the arena. You just zero out everything. And then probably zero out the uh, top of the free list as well. If you're going to use it still. And then you're done. So, yeah, like I said, hard to describe without visual diagrams. But hopefully that's uh, that's like one example of a more mm. complicated allocation situation that people are really familiar with. Yeah. Uh, that you can use with an arena. Gotcha. All righty. That was a yeah. lot. All right. Yeah. So I, I, I uh, could also. Well, I, I guess those are arenas. I, well, I, cu I could also specify there, there's one more concern that I should probably alleviate for people about this whole arena situation, which is that like the the high level concept of like when you're doing an allocation. Uh, you just pick an arena and then you forget about the allocation. It will get freed at an appropriate time if you picked the arena that you wanted or yep. that you needed. Uh, there's one concern that a lot of people have, which uh, initially when I introduced the concept of an arena, I said you pre-allocate this block of memory. And when people hear that, they'll go like, what if I don't use the whole block? Like, why am I just allocating 16 megabytes or what if I need more than that? What if in the worst case I need a gigabyte, but in the common case, I only need 64 megs or something. Do I really want to pre-reserve a gigabyte of memory on my user's machine if I'm not going to use it? That's like a concern that people bring up. And it is a concern if you're just, uh, if you actually physically allocate the whole block up front at once. But what's paired with this idea is that it's actually usually not a single memory block reserved up front. Um, there's two ways. There's two simple ways that you can do uh, an arena allocator that grows. And the first way is, is pretty simple. It's just chaining. So you have multiple chunks. So maybe each chunk is 16 megabytes or you make a bigger chunk if you need one. Uh, and th those chunks are sort of in a chain and you dynamically allocate those chunks as you need them. And then obviously when you free, it gets a little bit more complicated. You have to manage this list of chunks. Uh, but there is another style of growable arena which takes advantage of uh, modern virtual memory. Uh, modern virtual memory allocation on uh, like modern operating systems. And the modern operating systems, when I say that, I mean this feature has been around for decades and it's on pretty much every platform you use. Even 32-bit machines, they still have virtual memory allocation. It was needed a very long time ago for security and for uh, and for reliability. So virtual memory features are on every device you use, your phones, your video game consoles, your desktops, 32-bit uh, and 64-bit, it's all there. But you can generally have the guarantee that it's 64-bit these days. And that's a huge help because on modern CPUs, what you get access to is a 48-bit address space generally. And a 48-bit address space means you have uh, you can store addresses, uh, or it, it, it allows you to specify memory addresses uh, up to two to the 48 bits, or two, two to the 48 minus one, or whatever bits, and uh, or two to the 48 minus one as a value. Like that's the maximum address you can specify, and um, you know people who aren't familiar with it might go like, that's a little bit weird because I only have 16 gigabytes on my machine. So how could I have two to the 48, which I don't know, it's like 256 terabytes or something like that. How, you know, why, why would that matter to me at all? Uh, the reason why that's useful is because modern operating systems give you the ability to reserve address space without physically reserving memory. So you can say something like, I would like to reserve 64 gigabytes of address space but I don't want to commit any of it. Meaning I'm not going to have 64 gigabytes uh, of physical memory that I need right away. I just want to say those addresses are reserved for, for like this allocation. Like I want those addresses to be under my control. Nobody else should allocate them. And what that lets you do is implement an arena that that is a fixed size reservation of address space and then you only commit physical pages as needed. And that's a very simple uh, implementation as well because uh, it fits perfectly into the push and pop pattern that arenas fall into. So you, when you push memory onto an arena, 
that's um, that's sort of growing in virtual address space. Or, well, it's not growing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's built on this fixed size virtual address space reservation, but you don't commit until you need any of the memory. Uh, what happens is you don't only keep track of the allocation pointer, but you also keep track of the commit uh, uh, or allocation position in the arena. You also keep track of the commit position of the arena. And if the commit position is not high enough, meaning you don't have physical pages allocated for a new spot in the arena that you want to use, you have to commit pages. And that's when you go back to the operating system and say, okay, uh, you know this virtual allocation, this virtual uh, address space allocation that I made earlier, now I want to actually commit some of that address space to physical pages um, in physical memory. And um, what that basically means is that you can reserve 64 gigabytes or however much you want up to 250, probably not up to 256 terabytes because other things have to do virtual, uh, virtual address space reservations, but you can just <clears throat> commit or reserve absurd amounts of virtual address space, but only commit down to page granularity what you actually need. And the page granularity generally these days, it's uh, 4096 bytes, so four kilobytes. And so uh, as you push stuff onto the arena, as it goes into pages that you haven't yet committed, it will have to go to the operating system and say, okay, commit this page now. I need some physical memory here. And then... Uh, but and um, obviously that that does mean that th those pages are not contiguous. But that's true anyways. That's actually always true for all memory allocation on modern operating systems. Uh, but it looks like all that memory is contiguous in virtual address space to you. Um, so yeah, hopefully hopefully that's clear. Um, what in the. <laughs> Yeah. Alrighty. Yeah, no, that's, uh, that's, 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 that's really great. I mean, it's a perfect example of a kind of uh, system or uh, kind of like idea that you've taken from, uh, say, something like, well, all of this is coming from, uh, what is it, handmadehero.org. I'll, uh, I'll leave a link in the description somewhere. Yeah, uh, I don't know. If you want to learn more I, about like the specifics on, on on implementation details, would that be in there? Uh, I don't know if Casey ever did the virtual address space or uh, version of growing in Handmade yep. Hero. He did the chain. I, I think he did a chaining arena in Handmade Hero. But th these ideas have been kind of iterated on a lot within the Handmade.network community as well, which is not mm, yeah. not. Um, formally related to Handmade Hero, sort of formed around Handmade Hero and is now an independent community. And a lot of people in there did stuff like this. So if people are interested, you you could watch the uh, Handmade Hero episodes where Casey introduces the arena and shows what it would mean for an arena to grow in the chained fashion, I believe. I don't remember uh, what exactly he did. But um, yeah, you could also go to Handmade Network, ask people there about how you might go about doing the reserve a giant chunk of virtual address space, commit memory as needed. Um, people there will pretty much know exactly how to mm. do that. So, um, awesome. yeah. Yeah. Alrighty. So, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, I guess from here on out, uh, we'll use, when I say the term handmade, I guess I'm kind of referring to uh, this general style of like, you just grabbing um, information from a bunch of different sources and kind of like putting it in just like just for the sake of being able to categorize your way of programming right. i'm just gonna refer to it as like the handmade way from like he here on out even though okay. there's a bunch of different things on top of that yeah uh so this is this is like a perfect example of a handmade system that you've kind of like built and put a lot of work into and there's a lot of stuff that goes into it um but most people, like myself, I would not want to go and do that myself. Like, I want to sit down, I want to make some video games. Right. I want to not really spend all my time in this kind of like low level uh, area of trying to get stuff done. Yeah. Uh, it is good to go down there from, uh, from time to time, like when you do actually need to figure out some kind of custom solution, like in this case. Uh, but. Mm -hmm. The majority of the time, I mean, it was, uh, it was like that idea that I think I was talking to you a little bit about the other day, where I mentioned the Discord server of the, uh, the top-down versus bottom-up 
game development or programming, where in the top down, you're not really worrying about implementation details. You're kind of just taking these existing systems and running with them. So in this example, the whole arena allocate it, very easy to use. I've used it without even understanding what it does behind the scenes. I've used it and that's just how I've kind of like allocated my memory just without any knowledge of it whatsoever. I remember somewhere across it, you just like gave me an example of how to use it. I'm like, okay, cool. <laughs> right. And then I just ran with it. Uh, so that's absolutely beautiful. And there's a bunch of those kind of things things like we could talk all day about all the all these little systems that you've made uh within telescope right and yeah. that's 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 kind of where we're leading into telescope here but right telescope is basically like uh i would say like a collection of all these things that you've done and try to figure out a way of providing all these top-down like lego building blocks for you to use and then like used in like a top-down fashion even though You've programmed them from the bottom up, kind of first principles, trying to figure out how the computer works and like how best to program these things. Uh, but then, yeah, so we now have these like kind of building blocks that other people can come along and use without kind of worrying about the underlying implementation details, something akin to more like Unity, right? Right. If you're in Unity or Unreal Engine or any kind of game engine, you're not really worrying about uh, how everything runs on the scenes. You're just doing it and you're just making a game based off of that. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I guess that's the lead into Telescope here. And uh, I mean, some people are very, uh, are very keen to like get uh, like down and dirty with the implementation details. But I would say the majority of people, um, especially, uh, I guess, kind of listening to this, I mean, maybe not since we just talked for an hour about uh, like low level <laughs> implementation details. Uh, but the majority of yeah. people, uh, the majority of game devs I talk to, um, they are very much at like the top down approach of like, I want to design a game, I want to build a game. How do I go about doing that, right? Right, right. Um, so uh, this is kind of where Telescope comes in. And uh, yeah. you've been over the loss like few years You've just been going absolutely ham with this and uh, kind of building it up in the background. And uh, yeah, I mean, I don't really know where to start with Telescope, but yeah, I guess uh, that's a good place with the arena allocators. That's a good example of what you've done with it. Yeah, so Telescope has come from, I guess, over the years of as I've worked on games and as I've wanted to dig deeper for various reasons um, into lower level details, primarily because not because I have a predisposition to wanting to go super low level. I actually, I actually started by using game engines and I wanted to do this sort of top down okay. style of sort of arranging these building blocks that I had at my disposal to make a game that I, that I envisioned in my head. Like that was where I started and I, I, I like understanding how things work, but that wasn't, that's still not my primary goal actually, even though I've, for the past like several years, I've gone on like so many rat holes, just trying to really orient myself and figure out exactly how to be totally self-reliable and how to be able to, um, or self-reliant, how to be self-reliant and how to understand everything that I'm doing so that I can uh, throw away with things that aren't working for me. So my very first experience with building games was with RPG Maker. So it's a really old game engine, people might be familiar with it, might not be, but the whole pitch of RPG Maker was that it was uh, it was built to, it was like the perfect engine, I'm sure users of RPG Maker might disagree with that, they probably have their own problems with it, but it's like the perfect engine for building like Final Fantasy top-down to, uh, 2D RPGs, right? So there's kind of the, in the style of very old 2D RPGs. And, um, I never played Final Fantasy when I was a kid. I, I never played top-down 2D RPGs. They're the kind of game where you're locked to a tile grid and you go into a separate battle screen to like fight enemies and stuff and you're on like sort of a, it's like turn-based, you have moves that you can that you can play against, uh, against enemies and stuff like that. And uh, I was just not really interested in those games when I was a kid. I wasn't really exposed to them, but a, like a 
superficially similar game that I was exposed to was A Link to the Past. And A Link to the Past is a top-down, like everyone is probably familiar with it, you know, top-down 2D game, but it has real-time combat, and you're not locked to a grid. So you're like swinging at enemies with your sword in real time, and that was awesome to me. Like that was the kind of game I grew up with. Um, and uh, but I got really hooked onto RPG Maker, and I was kind of, I mean, I was like six at the time, so I didn't really know what was going on. But oh, wow. my yeah, so my ambition was like, oh, I want to make stuff like A Link to the Past with this RPG Maker tool. But soon you figure out that this engine was not built for that context. It was built for a different set of circumstances. So this engine was built to make this kind of game, and all the features are built around that paradigm of game. And so that was my first experience in game development, was like building games with RPG Maker, realizing that it wasn't adequate for what I was trying to build, and then having to toss it aside and try to investigate at a deeper level and try to figure out how to do things differently. And that's happened like repeatedly over the years where it's like, oh, I'll use this library for graphics. Oh, but that doesn't support this visual thing that I had in mind. That kind of sucks. And then at some point I'll like, oh, well, maybe I'll just have to throw that library away, learn how to render graphics myself. So, uh, and then eventually learn how to implement that, that effect I wanted. And, and it's just this infinitely deep rabbit hole. And uh, so I really yeah. don't want to come off as like the guy who just loves to dig into low-level problems, because I'm actually, I would not classify myself that way at all. Okay, cool. I'm, I'm, I'm glad we kind of made that distinction, because from my mind, I, uh, I actually didn't really know much about, like, your prior uh, story of, like, actually starting from all these game engines. And I mean, six years old, that's actually crazy. Yeah, I was I, lucky. I cannot remember what I was doing at six, but <laughs> definitely not that. <laughs> yeah, I, I was lucky because my brother, my brother is, uh, he's eight years older and he was really into uh, RPG Maker. And, um, oh, you know, wow, I was six, yeah. so he was, he was uh, six plus eight, four, he was 14. So he was, um, he knew about it and he showed it to me. So I was kind of lucky to be exposed to this stuff at such a young age, but, awesome. um, but yeah, I mean, it, it really was a story. Like my whole, when I think back on my my story as as like someone who wanted to make games or or interactive experiences, it really was this repeating story of like trying to use tools, figuring out they're inadequate in some way, and then having to toss them aside um, because I wanted to make something yeah. that fit my vision more. And so, telescope is like, right? Uh, I guess the first iteration of it was me culminating a bunch of code that I thought was useful for me while building really like a few different games, I would say. Like there was the Melodist obviously, which was the big one that I worked on for a long time. And that had like all this code, like it had stuff for managing assets and had a renderer and it had UI stuff in it and all that. I was like, I just don't want to have to write that again. I wanted to use those systems as like a t uh, as a top down building block, like you're talking about. And uh, mm. so I just kind of repackaged those up, and it, I've just aggregated stuff like that over over time. Now these days, I I was unhappy with all of that. So all of that's gone in like the new telescope stuff. <laughs> like I, 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 I <laughs> not, not to say that there's not the same like replacements for it. But all the original code for Telescope that I had aggregated over time, I was like, oh, this sucks. Like, it was another one of those processes of like, this sucks, throw it out, try something else. It was that, except with my own code this time. Uh, so, um, yeah, I, I would say Telescope is, is just a culmination of code and um, it's... It's sort of meant to be the, sh the shared landscape or shared context that I can at least use and hopefully other people can use as well to, like you say, use those top-down building blocks to build things that they want. Um, and I think it has some ideas that are different than uh, like many other systems. So like there's obviously there's frameworks. To, I, I would say the modern telescope vision is like somewhere in between a development environment, a framework, and on top of that, there can be things that are useful for game development specifically. But um, yeah. So it's not exactly a game engine, it's really just a way of making programs, really just building any kind of like tools out that you wanna build. Yeah, because I think the modern idea that I had for Telescope 
came when I was trying to think about what was useful about game engines. And, um, but also other systems too. And what I realized is that I feel, I feel like for me, 99% of, you know, maybe 90% of the utility of a game engine comes from a few different things. Notably the fact that you have user interfaces that have been tuned to organize data in a way that's useful to you. So in the RPG maker example, you have a tile map editor because your game is like fundamentally structured around the paradigm of tile maps and being on a tile grid and all of those things. So it makes perfect sense to have a tile map editor and you don't want to have to worry about like what file format does this editor export its tile maps in? Like you just don't want to have to care about stuff like that. You also don't want to have to care about like the coordinate system that the engine uses or that the tile map like, so what I'm trying to get at is the difference between a game engine and like decentralized tools. So decentralized tools, uh, you know, you could imagine someone building a tile map editor that's totally standalone and that does not hook into a game engine. And uh, what they would produce would be something like, you know, might be a really good program and might let you edit tile maps in a very easy way. But then what happens when you actually want to use whatever data that that produced. It's like, you have to start worrying about like, okay, what's the file format that they're storing this in? What's the coordinate system they're using for storing coordinates into the into the sprite sheet? Um, what, you know, how many layers are there? Can I have layers? Uh, can I, is there a fixed number of layers? Like, what's the deal? Uh, there's a bunch of things that just become very high friction about that process. And a game engine would be like, yeah. no, like we've taken care of all of that. Like we, here's the UI for building a tile map and then we'll give you a list of all the tile maps you've made and then you can place things on those maps like entities and then when you hit go you're dropped into your tile map that you built with all of the game features that you have turned on like lighting and like you know all this stuff and uh everything just sort of clicks together very nicely and what I when I was thinking about that I what I came to the conclu I, I came to the conclusion that why that is such a seamless process has to do with the fact that a game engine has a much easier problem to solve actually than the than the sort of person just working on the tile map the separate tile map editor tool and they have an easier problem because they can assume a lot more context about their users they can say okay you're making a game we'll take care of things like all the file formats all of the uh data transformations needed we'll take care of the coordinate spaces for the sprite sheet coordinates and and we'll take care of drawing these tiles on screen in both the editor and in in the runtime, like we'll take care of all that stuff versus the person just working on the standalone tile map editor. They don't know anything about what game someone is making. They don't know anything about the renderer. They're like, I don't know. I just, I just made a program to make tile maps and then I export it in this format. And then you go from there. Some people are like perfectly happy to yeah. use that tool, that standalone tool and be like, okay, I can write all the code to like parse the format and render the tiles myself and like do all the collision and all that stuff. Oh, that's another thing that you might want to specify, like uh, collision information, like how does that work, stuff like that. And so a game yep. engine just can assume a lot more, and as a result, the experience is way more seamless. It's, it's in a sense, it's a form of compression, I would say, because it, it's, um, you don't, you have to, the user has to specify much less information because it's sort of taken as a guarantee. So there's there's no need to communicate that information to anyone because the engine can make a lot of assumptions about like, oh, there, you, this is how collision works in this engine. This is how rendering works in this engine. All of those things. And so Telescope is is me trying to come up with a way to bring that to a more general level of tooling. So um, if you wanted to build a tool like a tile map editor or like a, uh, I mean, really anything, you can imagine like an Excel spreadsheet editor and you wanted that to click into other yeah. things like other tools in your in your in your sort of environment, like your text editor or like you know a level editor that you wrote yourself for your game or something like that. Uh, if you wanted those to click together, they would have to have they would have to be working within a context where they have mechanisms and and like a language by which they can communicate with each other. So they should mm. you know if you wanted them okay. to be rendered within the same window. You know, they should be like, obviously they have to be 
using the same like UI constructs. They have to be able to be drawn to the screen in a certain way that, that is, uh, hmm. they can't step on each other's toes, for example, like these multiple like plugins, for example, if you have your level editor and you have, uh, you know, your Excel's, not Excel, but like your spreadsheet editor or whatever, table editor thing, uh, just like different examples like that, you have all these tools, those need to sort of cooperate in a way that allows them yeah. to be used together without them having to be developed by the same people. Like that was the sort of big challenge with the game engine. It's much easier because, um, or I, I should say it's much more well-defined because, uh, you don't have to have those two tools written by different people, um, necessarily, or like they're underneath like the developers of the game engine. So the, the game engine developers can decide how two tools are supposed to work together and they package all of that up and present that to you as the as the environment that you'll be working in. But um, with Telescope, the idea was more, okay, how, do, how does someone build me a spreadsheet editor <clears throat> and how does someone else who, who never talked to that other person develop me a tile map editor and how do I combine those two inside of my environment in a way that lets me like copy and paste between them, uh, have some common assumptions about file formats and rendering and coordinate spaces. And then how do I compose that with my own tools that I maybe write myself? Um, would there be a way for that to integrate with like, oh, my programming, like I want my code to have like clickable hyp hyperlinks that open things and other tools. How does all of that work? And, and like, is that possible without the whole thing just being built by one team? that can make all those assumptions, which just gets you into the game engine case, basically. Um, yeah, yeah. And Telescope is about like, I think I found a way to do that. And I think the idea behind Telescope is to is to have that shared context. So there are some shared APIs. There are some, there, there are things you talked about before, like down to the lower level details of like memory allocation or string manipulation. Um, at a very low level, those things have sort of been worked through. So, uh, code written by different people can assume if they've been written like on top of those APIs, they can assume that shared context. It's like, since we're writing code okay. for telescope and not just C and the abstract, we know how to mem uh, allocate memory. We know how to do string processing. We also know how to make UIs. And then that goes all the way up to, we know how to copy and paste between each other. We know how to, um, we know jet, like there are some rules about how certain, uh, files are stored, how, how certain file formats are stored. There are rules about like rendering, for example, within the development environment. And there are rules about how plugins click into someone's environment as well. And mm. that's kind of the idea is to provide that shared context so that code sharing, decentralized tool development can happen um, on top of that base yeah. structure without it being controlled by like a single heavy-handed team. So hopefully <laughs> that was that was long. That is, hopefully wow. hopefully I communicated something of no, value. That but. is that is absolutely amazing. That just gets me insanely excited. Like just thinking about it from the perspective of you've got a bunch of different people trying to solve problems, uh, be it like make games or whatever. And right. they can each kind of build their own kind of tools and building blocks and that can click into telescope in such a way where say each of those blocks are composable with all the other blocks so you could maybe kind of consider telescope uh you know how on lego bricks you have like the the the, the six little circles and they like click into like the bottom of the other little bricks this right. is like a bit yep. of a weird analogy but you could maybe consider telescope those yeah. little things that allow the bricks to connect. But right. also you have the bricks themselves that you are kind of building, right? So it's like a shared language of communication and context throughout the entire thing. Right, yeah, yeah. Um, the, the like connectors on the little plastic Lego bricks are sort of the, the, they're the texture of the system. And the fact that those like, if two 
different companies produced Lego bricks or like little plastic Lego bricks, but they used different connectors, those two things would be not composable. And so you would need like an adapter, right? Yeah. You need like an adapter that takes one set of connectors to the other set of connectors, and then you could connect those blocks. And that's basically the situation that everyone has to be in when they use various tools on a computer today, is that all mm. of the connectors are different between their tools. And this is true, especially on a game team, because when people build like, uh, when people game, when people build game development tools, um, it's not like one domain of tool development because you're producing tools for artists, for example. So you have tools like, you know, um, Maya or Blender or ZBrush. And then you also have programming tools, which is an entirely separate part of the industry, which is like totally different. And that's like stuff like Visual Studio, obviously, and the compiler stuff and all of that. And so it's totally disparate areas. And as a result, the, the environments are totally different and there's no clicking together. There's none of the, the composability of Lego bricks um, that happens there. And instead you have the engine team patch all of that up by building the adapters and, you know, be, obviously because they have to take yeah. like the source asset data, turn that into runtime asset data that the engine knows how to, you know, efficiently load up and render on screen. And all of that stuff has to happen by the engine team and um it's kind of unfortunate like it'd be nice if we weren't so segmented into designers artists and, and programmers and instead if the environment was one cohesive place where if you wanted to like hop into the code really quickly and see how something was working while using your artist tool you could kind of just do that um without it having to be this like labor intensive right. process of of writing plugins for the different tools and having them somehow communicate with each other. Uh, the theory is that if Telescope provides an adequate amount of context, then that kind of stuff can happen very easily with almost no effort. Hmm. Okay. So, yeah, it really is the power of composability here. I mean, I've, uh, I, was, I was talking yeah. to you about this the, uh, the other day, but... Uh, just kind of having, this is kind of where the community aspect comes in, but having right. the ability to make, uh, I guess the familiar word here would be plugins. Having the ability to make plugins uh, in at kind of like a mass, like kind of like community level is just so incredibly powerful. Like, like you can think of this happening in Minecraft mods, like mods are just absolutely amazing. Um, right. They just bring so much life to the game. Or on the level of, say, I use an app called Obsidian, and that has a bunch of plugins yeah. on it that kind of just transform the app into w literally whatever you want it to be, right? In, in, the, uh, in right. the context of personal knowledge management and note-taking. And that's just, oh man, it's so bloody powerful. Um, so I guess this is where like the whole community aspect uh, comes in. And I don't know how much you want to get into this, but... Yeah. Uh, yeah. This is kind of like the uh, the up and coming next step for Telescope because I mean, like you said, you've been working on this rewrite of Telescope, and I was uh, I was using the old version of Telescope, like the uh, kind of like the OG one. Right. Uh, I mean, not the OG OG one, but like uh, <laughs> the the one before this version, and so that's what I was kind of working in Arcane with. Uh, I was building Arcane with. Uh, and so you went up, like you started this rewrite. Uh, I mean, it's probably a while back now. Uh, but I basically, I mean, well, this new version hasn't really been ready to use. Uh, I mean, I think it's, I think it's getting ready now. I think it is almost ready for a, uh, for a project to like hop in and test something out, do something small. Right. But uh, so that's kind of why I've stepped up into Unity, uh, just to kind of use that temporarily, uh, because I think there are some meta skills that you yeah. can develop in the context of game development of like uh, various like game design aspects, various like just ways about going about For the sure. top down process of limiting your scope, uh, trying to actually ship. And so that's what I've been trying to cultivate in Unity. And, you know, you can do that in absolutely any image and whatsoever. It does not really matter yeah. what game engine you use when it comes to that kind of idea. Um, right. But yeah, man, I'm I 
I've, I've just been sitting in Unity and I've just been homesick, you know? I've just been sitting there like, <laughs> oh man, this is, this really just isn't that fun for me. Um, right. Like, at the beginning it was kind of fun because I was like clicking a few buttons and the game was basically making itself. Uh, but, <laughs> yeah. you know, when it comes time to like, you know, I'm just sitting down there doing some sheets, some C sharp scripting and it's like, you know, it, yeah. I just feel I feel like it's kind of sucked the uh, the craftsmanship out of it for me, and I'm kind of like a optimized machine, just downloading assets from the asset store and bashing them together into a game. Um, <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I am very excited to jump back into Telescope, though. Yeah, and for especially sure. Especially from this context of like we can kind of start making it more and more. Um, friendly to use from the perspective of just someone coming in and uh, trying to use it. So, because you've done all this work of uh, just this shared kind of like context and, you know, like the, uh, the arena allocators we were talking about before and then so many things on top of that. Yep. Uh, yeah, it's just very excited for this whole uh, next step. Yeah, for sure. So, um, yeah, I think... Um, the thing about one thing that happens in game engines, there's like a bunch of stuff to say about that. Um, one thing that happens in game engines is your scripting model, at least in, in unity. I know in unreal, for example, you can just dive in and write a bunch of custom stuff yourself. Um, you still have to interface with the rest of the engine, but what I've, what I've noticed seems to happen in a lot of cases is if you wanted to do something that's a little bit more heavy handed with regards to how the game is running, uh, certain game mechanics, for example, um, it's sometimes more difficult to shoehorn that into the structure of Unity or Definitely. or a different game engine. Um, this happened like, yeah. This kind of happened with RPG Maker actually. When I was trying to build the like a link to the past style combat, I was like having to hack it into the uh, like event system inside of RPG Maker, and so you could run up to enemies and like hit enter okay. and hit them. But obviously the animations weren't there. Like there was all sorts of problems. Like it was not good, um, and yeah. you know, really what I needed was not to try to find like the right thing inside of the engine. Really, what I needed was just to drop down a level and say, okay, well, I actually just want to write my own code for this that does exact. I mean, obviously you'd have this is a bad analogy now because you'd have to throw out like a ton of the assumptions that RPG Maker made to make something like a Link to the Past, but. A lot of times what you want to do is drop down a level and say, like, I know exactly what I want here. This is what I would like to happen. Um, and uh, sometimes that doesn't compose well with a model uh, that a game engine has assumed. And so that's why I think composability is really important. Um, for I mean, for game engines, but also for the general, like, tool space, like for Telescope, it's you want composability so that someone doesn't have to depend on everything you've decided is a good idea at some point. They should be able to depend on a subset of that. And um, yeah. so obviously if you wanted to make a plugin, you do have to conform to a certain set of, of assumptions. Like you, you, know, you have to make your UI in a certain way, you have to render in a certain way, stuff like that. But um, that doesn't necessarily have to lock into a bunch of other decisions made by other people about like, this is how exactly, we store tile yeah. maps or something. Yeah. If you didn't want to have to depend on that, you shouldn't have to. And that's why I think, um, sort of composability and module, like, uh, modularity, I, I think of, of, of many things. Like, I think, I think what's happened is that because of the community goal of telescope, which I can talk about, the the requ the technical requirement of telescopes architecture has become uh, such that you have both modularity and composability of um, of layers that people can can use. So that goes down to the code level. So if you just wanted to depend on the non graphical aspects of the operating system abstraction in telescope, you could do that. Uh, or if you wanted to depend on the base operating system abstraction layer plus the graphical abstraction layer in the operating system stuff, you could also do that and without having to touch anything else in the engine, like you could, um, or anything else in the environment and the framework, you could do that. Uh, and um, I think all of that stuff is really important. Uh, so, and yeah, I think that that's, um, yeah, I th I guess that's what's really exciting about the project to me 
um, or that's that's what's exciting about the project to me is that you do have composability so that nobody's actually locked in. You still have a lot of control, but when that shared context can be taken advantage of, it will be. Um, and there's not just one context that has to be assumed for the entire project. People can pick the parts of the context they would like to build for, and then that'll just work for that layer. Um, mm, yeah. So just kind of like as pick for your the modules, pick, pick whatever you need the tools that you need and just right. go ahead. Right. And um, yeah, going back to the community aspect. Right. So with the community aspect, the idea is that um, because the architecture is built in a way to allow people who don't talk to each other to build two different tools that will hopefully be able to communicate in a useful way. What that opens the door to is a community of people who either like to work on tools, uh, like to work on lower level stuff, like, uh, like, you know, low level asset pipeline stuff or rendering code or stuff like that. It allows them to contribute to an ecosystem of both parts of the framework and also parts of the tool development environment. Um, so somebody wants to write again, like I mentioned, like certain editors, uh, like, 3D material editor, like physically based rendering material editors, stuff like that. Um, they could, they could work on a tool that's useful for them for that, and that could, uh, that would be like a community driven thing. So it wouldn't be one specific team, just pushing whatever they think is right into, you know, this development environment. Instead, it's like. A community member who chooses to take the shit like the context layer of telescope saying i'm going to build a tool for the telescope environment when they build that that actually becomes available for other people in the ecosystem in the same way that um you know if you imagine visual studio or or uh, a game engine for example if they're like oh we, we came up with a new tool that we want inside of the level editor for people to use uh, here's that tool and like it's in this panel down here and you can interact with it there. Um, the telescope would allow that same phenomenon to happen except in a decentralized way. So someone could say, oh, I produced this plugin, it does this stuff and uh, it interacts with all the other stuff in the engine or the environment or whatever. I don't know what to call it, but um, uh, and so, like, here I just published this this plugin so you can grab that and then use it immediately. And it'll click right into your environment mm -hmm. just like everything else does. Um, and the, the yeah. community aspect would just be just the effort of people coming together, clicking onto this context. So it's not saying, like, oh, like, anyone can just ditch whatever part. I mean, obviously, like, they can ditch a lot of things that they don't want to use if they... If they don't care to use a bunch of parts of the uh, of the environment, but um, it's just providing a platform for people to say, okay, we're going to build for this shared context, and that'll help all of us. Uh, like it, it, it's sort of like a uh, um, I don't know I don't know how to describe it other than an ecosystem. It's just people coming together saying we're going to attach to this mm. context without working on the same projects. Right, so uh, two different people could be working on two entirely yeah. different projects, totally unrelated to each other, but they could still share code and they could still share tooling, and um, yeah, that would help a lot of things. Like that would help with tutorial production. It would help with code sharing, obviously tool sharing, um, and I mean, I think it it would it would help a lot for people to hop onto new teams together. So if two people want to start a project, you know, they're instantly in pretty good shape if they're familiar with the same environment in the same way that they would be for unity mm. except with telescope it's much more decomposable right you can say like no we actually just want to throw out all of this stuff in inside of telescope and only build off of this small core part or whatever um and then go from there so that's kind of the the pitch i guess um it's not really a pitch because it took like i don't know an hour to get through it but uh, that's the uh, that's the idea. Of the, uh, <laughs> Not quite stuff. an elevator pitch, <laughs> right? Yeah. Right. No, that's yeah. that's that's just that's bloody awesome. And uh, I mean, you can kind of think about it from the sense of 
uh, one guy kind of just developing his own tools, say in, uh, say like an engine like Unity, like over time, you kind of get a set of your own kind of uh, just different tools and ways of doing things. Uh, right. So say you like build out one specific system for this game, but it could also be used in this game. It's like over time that guy then uh, builds up a bunch of tools um, that they can use, and it's and it's a and it's very much a compounding effect, right? Because you know you you start a new project, and all of a sudden you've got all these building blocks in front of you that you can also re reuse. Right. But then what I'm excited about with Telescope is that that kind of takes that to the next level where it's not just one person, but an entire community of people uh, with these shared kind of building blocks that they're right. all kind of building in their own, for their own kind of purpose, you know? This dude's making a game, this guy's making a different game, or this other person's just working on something, just some kind of, uh, some kind of tool for uh, making art or something. And it's like, all the stuff that we do can just, be done together and just be reused by the entire like ecosystem. So it's very much a another order of magnitude above the uh, solo compounding benefits right. of uh, building tools. Yeah, yeah. And that's, yeah, that's really exciting. Yeah, for sure. So I, I think part of the challenge for me has been trying to package up the idea in a way, it makes a lot of sense in my head, but it's very difficult. It's a very difficult thing to present to people because it's hard to find yeah. common words that that describe what it is exactly um but so you know yeah. we had to have a long discussion hopefully that's like the first iteration of trying to boil it down i've been trying to work on like shorter descriptions uh namely for the website that should come out <laughs> soon i've been trying to yeah. do like i mean the, how the, heck the do best I word way of people? compressing information is definitely like trying to have a conversation with someone and <clears throat> right excuse me and that's definitely like that's that's how we compress ideas as human beings is having conversations and like you kind of force yourself to try and get your point across in as in like less words than last time. It's just the more and more you explain these things out loud, it just kind of boils it down right. to its essence. And I mean, we had like probably a good couple hours of uh, context there, like building up like all the examples of. I mean, we dove all into garbage collection, and then there was an example of one of those kind of like. Um, one of those tools with the uh, with the arena allocator, like within the telescope context. Right. Uh, but there's plenty more examples. Like for example, one that I uh, find really interesting is that you haven't you you haven't started with something say like GLFW, where that already gives you uh, you know uh, just a way of like rendering things and uh, interfacing with uh, the operating system. And I think GLFW might be multi-platform. Not too sure, but uh, uh, um, you've kind of like taken that to another level and uh yeah sorry just go ahead uh, you're gonna say something yeah um so glfw is like it's not even actually a rendering abstraction it's uh it's like the uh graphical operating system abstraction layer equivalent uh, or yeah. it's equivalent to telescopes graphical uh Operating system abstraction, oh, yeah, yeah. abstraction layer, and the graphical abstraction. Yeah, sorry. I, I, I think I had SDL in mind. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, um, but yeah, no, totally. It, it is kind of, it's the same sort of idea, right? You have, um, you have mm. one particular layer, that's, that's built for a certain purpose, and um, in the case of SDL, for example, it's sort of a conglomerate of a lot of different purposes, right? It's, it's, it's abstraction layers yeah. for. Uh, opening windows on multiple operating systems or starting to render very simple graphics, um, playing sound, uh, communicating over a network, stuff like that. Uh, mm. It's sort of, that's, the, the Telescope is built that way, but it's it's because it's not a library, it's not meant to be like a library that you send to someone and say like, oh, like here's the framework that you can use or here's the library you can use to start you know, like SDL does this where it's, like I said, it's a conglomerate. It offers so many different things. Um, and it is, it is modularized to some degree. Like you can use SDL net without using the rest of SDL. Like there's a lot of stuff you can do like that. But um, with telescope, each layer can be, first of all, it can, sh it can assume a lot more, right? Um, 
because it, since it's taking more of a heavy-handed framework approach, it's saying this is how memory allocation is done within the engine. Here's how, or within the uh, within the code base. Here's how strings are encoded. Here's all the string processing stuff. Here's all the math types and math functions. All that stuff is just shared base context. Um, and uh, yeah. And there's a ton of shared stuff like that. So, um, and uh, yeah, I mean, so each layer, like uh, networking, graphical operating system abstraction, uh, just base operating system abstraction without any graphic stuff, um, rendering, UI, like all of that stuff sort of just builds on top of each other until you get all the way up to the, to the sort of visual tool area where it's like actual plugins that people can click into your environment um, that yeah. you can use. Um, yeah. So yeah, no, that's, that's, that's quite great. And that's, uh, and that's kind of something that, that really has imp impressed me as well. Like you've essentially, so I mean, uh, Hamid here, they, they kind of, um, or Casey kind of does this from the ground up where he just goes, he just hops on the uh, Win32 API and just goes. Right. And, uh, and, and it's quite great. And you've kind of like done a really nice abstraction with that. Uh, so you've got like, uh, say like the platform layer, which uh, can literally just plug into any platform you want. Windows, Mac, Linux, uh, iOS or whatever, right? And uh, you kind of just have like that shared, like say you're just trying to like save something to a file, you know, there's kind of like a shared idea of that and you can just use that no matter what operating system you're on. So that's like the abstraction layer there. And then you've also got another abstraction layer for the graphics uh, API. So something like, I think you're using DirectX nowadays. That's kind of what you're um, kind of going with, just like testing the, uh, just like your actual implementation. Yeah, so um, should clarify that like at the beginning, Telescope won't be like totally cross-platform or anything. It's It's, focused on windows since that's where most tool and experience yeah, yeah. and game development happens um but yes that's the idea is like the all it's, these it's, it's it's just got the potential there yeah right yeah it's like it's it's doing the abstraction work for other platforms even though a whole back end hasn't been written for all of them yet but um yeah, yeah same yeah, thing yeah. for the graphics generally on windows you my preference these days is to use the native apis that each platform prefers you to use and so for example i used to i used to use opengl for um all my rendering stuff on even on windows and opengl drivers on windows for a variety of hardware vendors is not particularly good you run into a lot of reliability issues there are some performance issues um it's not usually a concern although the most notable the most notable example of it is actually startup time. Like all of your OpenGL applications just take like half a second more to start up. And it's really like, oh, wow. it doesn't sound like a lot, but it's really annoying. It's actually suit, like if you're trying to test something and for the first half second to a second, your game or your program or whatever is like white and just blank. It's just super frustrating. Yeah. Oh it's, man, it's, I like that's, that's, that's something that's been uh, really annoying me about Unity is every time I press a play button, it's like, it's probably like half a second or a second, but it's just, it, oh man, it's just so long, you know? Right, right. Little <laughs> friction like that, good. little friction like that really does add up. And, and so I, but yeah. that's like the least of the crimes of OpenGL on, of OpenGL drivers specifically <laughs> on Windows. It's, um, it gets worse than that. Like there's a lot of really stupid stuff that happens and just bugs uh, that, that are, totally not um it's not like oh you didn't read the spec of the function correctly or the docs of the function correctly like you didn't write your shader correctly according to the spec nothing like that it's literally like arbitrary little details of the way you happen to write the shader end up making a gigantic difference in whether the pro a whether the program even works or not like you might just get a black screen um and yeah. B, like whether it runs well, like there's a bunch of OpenGL drivers are just not a good, they're just bad on Windows. And uh, so mm. uh, on the Windows platform, which I think is the primary one to target, is uh, I'm using Direct3D 11. Um, the, from my understanding, there's n real no reason to go Direct3D 12 unless you're like a AAA game studio. 
um, these days. But Direct 3D 11 is still very good for for basically yep. every purpose that I would that I would be involved with um, for the foreseeable future. Also, and, then, so, and, and that just comes from the perspective of like uh, trying to build games. Most people are on Windows. Let's talk at Windows. So that's where you're just grabbing the back ends of Windows and Direct 3D 11 and just kind of like doing it from that place because that's the most common way to do it. Right. And but uh, just like with operating systems, it's still it's still like an abstraction layer. So you still have the rendering back and abstracted. Yeah, yeah. You could write an OpenGL back end. You could write a Win32 software rendering back end if you wanted to. Um, and it would be really slow, but it could work. And um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, so yeah, I, uh, but right now the primary backend, like the only one I've written so far, because it's still like, the renderer is still very, uh, very, uh, what's, what's the word, immature, I guess, like I haven't, it's, it's totally new and it's only been tested against the UI requirements for the, for the tooling layer, like for the tooling environment, the development environment, I guess. So it's it's very immature renderer right now. So while that stuff just gets more mature, I want to keep it on Direct 3D 11 for now. Um, mm. But yeah, eventually OpenGL backend is fine. Um, Vulkan, if it's even worth it, it might be. Um, and then uh, you know any yeah anything else would would also work. Um, but yeah, primarily Direct 3D 11 seems to make sense. Metal could also click into it. Awesome. Uh, forgot to mention Metal. So. Yeah, gotcha. Beautiful. Alrighty. Well, yeah, there's a uh, there's definitely a lot to unpack here for 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 someone who's kind of like considering getting into C development or this kind of like uh, area. Um, get like getting started with C programming. I guess. Where do you think they should go? Um, I I guess it depends a lot on how much programming they've already done. So if if this person who's getting into C programming or lower level programming in general would like to learn a little bit more about, like they've done a lot of programming in like higher level languages like Python, JavaScript, C Sharp, but they would like to see how native development works. I, I always recommend Handmade Hero as a good resource. It's, it's, I mean, I was doing a lot of C++ programming before I found Handmade Hero. But it really was, Casey has a really good way of explaining things, and it, it just is, uh, it's, it's, um, it was remarkably helpful for me. Um, and yeah. I, I can't, I don't really know, there's like, um, there's like level up periods in your life. You get to certain points in your life where you just feel like you, lo you look back on the past few months and you're like, wow, I just leveled up. Like I'm just totally a better programmer or better, really this applies to any environment, but you just look back a few months and you're like, I am just totally a different person in this domain now. That was totally yeah. a hero for me. Um, so uh, gotcha. yeah, I, I recommend people going. Alrighty. I mean, there. like, I guess from, uh, I guess this kind of like leads into the whole uh, Telescope community aspect, but is there any kind of timeline or whatnot for other people coming into Telescope and uh, kind of being able to just kind of skip that entire, because I mean, you've, you've put in all this hard work of uh, uh, just kind of like learning about all this like low level stuff, uh, watching like Handmade Hero going through all that, like all these years of development um, and thought has gone into this. And uh, for someone who kind of just like me who just wants to kind of get into game development not worry too much about putting like a decade worth of study into this up front uh in order to get to where telescope is today uh is there any time when of like them just like coming in and just being able to use telescope for say like game development or whatnot um yeah i think i i don't have a strict t uh timeline at the moment but i i would say because it's it's uh you know part time for me and a lot of stuff's going on in my life, so uh, like I'm getting married soon, and that's been I've been, I've been like wedding planning yeah. and like up to my neck and that kind of stuff. So it's um, I'm chipping away at it as time goes on. I assume sometime within this year, I'll start being able to um, like pro. I mean, for a very for a select few people, it'll probably start like certain yeah, parts I of it will start being usable within the next few months or something. I would say. 
Um, yeah. But it'll be like... I think... Uh, sorry, go ahead. I think by the time this podcast goes up, uh, we should have the mailing list up and running. Right. Uh, so I'll leave a link to that down in the description. So you would just go sign up to that. And you'll be just notified whenever this uh, stuff starts rolling out, I think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we've got the Discord up and coming. Uh, so, like, just very small kind of, like, steps uh, will build up to eventually uh, people being able to come in and use it, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And but I think... No fixed timeline yet. Yeah, I, th I think um, a lot of the early <clears throat> stuff will be pretty low-hanging fruit. Like, it'll just be... It's... I, I, I originally called Telescope my game engine but i want to sort of distance itself i want to distance telescope from that label um and it's really more of a uh it's it'll start by being just some shared context that programmers can use together so probably i mean just to start the very first thing that i could put out there today would just be my base layer and also probably my operating system abstraction layer like there's stuff like that that'll come out at first where it'll just be yeah. very simple stuff that's not necessarily for games it's because uh, telescope's whole pitch is to be a layer for tooling in general or for just using a, a computer in general you could even use it with other game engines so it's not meant to be like a competitor or anything like that it's supposed to be like a a new way for tools to interact and, and work together on a computer so um but obviously yep. there's runtime stuff too. So there's there's code that maybe you would want to use in a game or something like that. But anyways, so, um, but yeah, so I think very little pieces of it will probably start being packaged up and ready to use relatively soon. It won't be like the full vision right away. Um, but yeah, gotta start yeah, yeah. somewhere and we'll, we'll put out like certain, uh, um, j I mean, just like the layers we were talking about, th there's... There's the operating system abstraction, the base layer, which has all the memory arena, memory allocation stuff, the string stuff. Like, s s strings in C are also a hard subject for a lot of people. Um, I've learned a lot yeah. by uh, by working with other people and, and just, um, again, not all my original ideas or anything. It was just lessons I've learned from other people, working from other people, working on it myself. So there's a bunch of stuff there. There's also, like, there's uh, metaprogramming stuff. Like, there's... There's, there's a Ooh, lot of yeah. stuff that'll start that's, like... That's some juicy stuff. <laughs> right, yeah. Um, it's a rabbit hole. There's so much good stuff in here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, but I think I think it'll be really good. But yeah, it'll start with the small stuff. And um, and I think that'll be a useful place for things to start. And um, people could start yeah. just using like, hey, like, here's the arenas, here's the strings, here's the... Like, um, What's the other stuff in the base layer? There's a bunch of stuff in the base layer where it's just like shared. That's like mm. the ultimate shared context. It's like math types and crap like that, that you, yeah, you can yeah. just always have at your disposal. You could just start using that right away. And then obviously as time goes on, it'll be like, okay, well, here's here's the rendering layer. Here's the drawing layer. Um, here's the UI stuff. So you can make UIs really easily. Um, uh, here is the... Uh, and then, and then obviously that goes all the way until we have like the actual, what's known as the client of telescopes. So the telescope client is the place where it's the, it's the development environment basically, where you have a code editor, you also have mm. other plugins that you can write and plug in. Uh, that stuff is further down the line, but I think the, yeah, like I said, really early on, we'll just have the really small stuff. Is that something where say you could have like a viewport for the world in? So it's similar to kind of like other game engines like unity yeah for sure so like the one experiment i did yeah. already was um i did a 2d version of that basically where um oh, awesome. you just have yeah like side by side with your code editor you can also have a uh like a two-dimensional view of entities um the, in, in the world kind of thing. And, and yeah so it's 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 uh the early prototypes the of features like that are here. Right, yeah, it it gets, it gets pretty cool, um, and yeah, it's 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 hard to say where it's gonna go, but I think um, I think there's something really cool here that I think will be useful mm. um, for me because I mean I don't know I'm always in the position where I want to just spin up a tool really quickly or just have some data that I want to visualize or have a graph where I can play around with it uh, visually and. Yeah. Um, 
telescope is like that's ki it's kind of in my head it's sort of the dream environment where I can just open up my telescope client um, start working on a plugin in the code editor that visualizes things in a way that I want maybe it's three dimensional data maybe it's two dimensional in plots or something like that and then as I'm working I can hit like compile and then like the plugin updates in real time as I'm sort of typing away and uh, kind of just using data in that way would be awesome for me so there's there's just so much there there's a really wide possibility space um and uh yeah yep i'm I'm really excited awesome yeah do you have any kind of rough idea for uh i think we we're talking about this a little bit the other day but like the tiers and the kind of pricing um do you have any like kind of rough idea of uh that and what it's really going to take to be able to get your hands on like the base layer or the, like the platform layer and whatnot and start using that. I think, I think the really basic stuff should probably just be free. Like the base layer is not a lot of code. Yeah. It's not totally original ideas. It's just, it's useful stuff for people to have. But I think um, originally we'll, um, like you said, there will be a tiered system. So people who want to, for example, be in the sort of tighter community where, um, they get like certain levels of source access or they want to work on telescope itself or they would like to um, yeah. be in the, be in the community that's doing a lot of code sharing, a lot of tool sharing. That might be, I don't have a good idea of like the exact structure there or the pricing yet, but um, mm, yeah, it'll be, you know, there might be, uh, there might be some, some like sort of crowdfunding style support that happens there. So people, paid to, to both get access to that level and also to join the community. Um, I'm, I'm a pretty firm believer in, in um, whatever you make you own and um, like, so, uh, and also whatever software you pay for you have. Uh, so I don't, I don't believe in like subscription models or anything like that. I believe in people, if they want okay. to pay recurring to, to be a part of the community, then they can. Um, but if they, it, gotcha. you know, if they pay once, Maybe there's a one-time fee to get access to what you want. Um, and then as far as, and then maybe you lose access to like major updates or something like that. Like you don't own it permanently and all up, all future updates and support, but um, you know, maybe you get access to it that way. And, um, mm. and then, yeah, maybe you have to pay again for major updates or something like that. But uh, gotcha. yeah, that's, that's the idea. Uh, At the very yeah, top, it, I want to have uh, a small group of, it, Sorry, go, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, um, I was going no, no, sorry, to... I was, uh, I was just, just go. Okay. Um, I, uh, at the very top level, I want to have like a small circle of people who are working on, on Telescope, who are sort of more invested in the project, yeah. who want to work on it publicly or work on stuff with it publicly. Um, and at that point, like that's, they won't have to pay for that or anything. They'll just be a part of like sort of the inner circle. Um, but uh, yeah. So, but, so far that's really just me and you though. <laughs> right, that's just, that's just us two right now. Um, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so, but hopefully there will be some people who are interested in that. Definitely, kind of thing. yeah. Uh, that, would, that, would, that would be really exciting if, uh, if, if, if people are interested in uh, jumping in on here for the, uh, trying to develop telescope and, you know, just start, you know, building this stuff up, building Lego bricks and uh, just mashing right. them together. That, that sounds yep. very exciting. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Alrighty. Well, I think that's pretty much um, just about everything that I wanted to talk about in terms of like telescope. I mean, that was, uh, we definitely covered a lot of ground there. I think I'll put like a little disclaimer at the start telling people to like skip all the programming talk if they're not <laughs> exactly interested in that. Right, right. They can get to this uh, telescope stuff. But there is like, yeah, there is definitely a lot of uh, beautiful stuff that goes into. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to see what the, uh, what the future is going to hold with this bad boy. Very, uh, very keen to get developing. And I mean, as, uh, as far as yep. this next project goes, um, I mean, I was talking to you a little bit about this, but, um, 
Yeah. I was thinking of doing like some pixel simulation stuff again, but then you're like, oh, maybe a bit too high scope. So uh, <laughs> might try for a simple little like platform or something uh, to yeah. try and test out this new version of telescope and uh, get it up and running. But uh, yeah, very excited to get cracking on that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think um, it's yeah, it's it's probably good to start with a smaller scope. Um, project uh just to you know yeah be be very conservative in how, how much we try to jump for at one time but uh yeah so yeah um, so we're trying to do like custom shaders and all that it's like nah, it's a bit of a mess so we're trying to test out just like the basic rendering um yeah just just some very basic stuff yeah so a, a, a platform would, would probably be a good example or something simple yeah uh, because yeah. i did actually make a platform with a mate the other day in unity and we kind of uh it was it was supposed to be just like a one day project, but extended out to like a few days. Oh, wow. As those kind okay. of things do. But we, but we did get something up and running within a few days. And it's like complete game. So, right. Uh, yeah, no, that was, that, was, that was quite exciting. So maybe something similar. Um, I am yet to think of an idea though. So we'll see how we go. <laughs> yeah. 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 It might be a good idea to like see how the flow works as well. Like how fast is it to just use the, the, all the built-in unity stuff versus how fast is it to sort of use telescope as the sort of like the mm. the um the environment by which you can do sort of a more native c style approach like much more quickly yeah. it might be pretty interesting to see like the time differences and and um yeah my how, how easily. general yeah my my general thinking with this is it's probably going to take somewhere in the ballpark was twice as long uh, especially all the physics stuff unless yeah, yeah. i literally just grab like uh a uh, a single header physics library which i think that's probably what i'm gonna end up doing just randy goals uh i think he's got box 2d or like cute c2 for the narrow phase of collision uh, which is yep. what i was using in the past so that i mean like that should be relatively easy and then particles is another one that I'm thinking of that might be a little bit tricky, but I think a basic particle system should be good enough. Yeah. Um, yeah. As long as there's sound in there, that 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 should be easy enough. Um, and UI, I think you said you've got UI in already, though. Yeah, UI is like um, a lot better too than the original. Telescope awesome. UI. I, I've done a lot of um, UI programming over the past few years, so I've um, I've really iterated on on how that kind of stuff looks, and uh, awesome. I think it's gotten a lot better. So um, it should it should. I'm be, really looking forward to trying it out. Yeah. Yeah, UI should be like pretty good to go. Um, if it's not, then I've like get, uh, that's that's a problem. I feel like I should be really good at at this point. So. If it's not really easy to get up and running with a pretty good UI, then I've done something wrong. Um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I uh, when like when I first came to the uh, the telescope UI, I mean, I was I was really quite uh, amazed by it. I mean, it, it follows like the whole immediate mode UI system, which is just so much easier to work with. You right. just kind of like do it all in line. Yeah. Uh, and that was like an absolute treat. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm keen to see what else you've done on top of that. Yeah, for sure. I think um, it's much easier to do like custom widgets and stuff now. Like I've really figured out how to do... Okay, yeah. Like a, um, the original telescope UI was kind of broken with... Or not broken, but it was just poorly architected in the sense of like, if you looked at the implementation of a button call, for example, it was like you know, a lot of complicated logic and stuff, or, or it was calling into a function that did a lot mm. of complicated logic with, um, and it was, it was just not very, you couldn't use the button as a useful example of how to implement a custom widget basically. But now with the modern gotcha. telescope UI stuff, it's all like when you look at the implementation of the standard button call, it's sort of the basic example of how to set up a clickable widget that would with just some text drawn on it basically or or and also some borders and uh stuff like that awesome um it's just all well, that, that that sounds like a very good code, basically uh example to look at i wish i had the full side of even checking the button code when i was writing custom widgets in telescope <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 uh, for but sure. yeah no that's that's 
That's awesome. Oh, I'm, I'm also very keen, like this, this is something I'm personally kind of excited to dive into. It's like the whole kind of like docs aspect of uh, trying to like present or trying to just walk through the entire engine in a way that like a, a beginner to the entire system could like look at. And then, uh, yeah, just like go through the docs, like filter through and kind of like learn various aspects of like the uh, the base layer and whatnot. I think that's very interesting. Um, and also, uh, I guess like the whole idea of just like roadmaps and like team management. I don't know. That's that that stuff's very exciting to me. Uh, Notion is quite fun. <laughs> just like yeah. mess around with and uh, <laughs> try and tinker with. Yeah, uh, for sure. Yeah. I, th I think I, the, uh, the... Do you... Uh, oh, uh, sorry. Um, go ahead, sir. Dude, I, 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 I fucking hate this delay. I yeah. Swear to God. <laughs> no, it's, it's, I totally get it. I So many delays with uh, all the podcasts I did for Handmade Network. It was a nightmare, but yeah, so I get it. But um, <laughs> yeah, no, I think, uh, I think it'll be... That's one good example of how the development environment can be just a lot more fluid it'll just have it'll be very trivial to just have docs integration just right inside of the code editor yeah. inside of the uh inside of the telescope client so i mean all that stuff you just oh yeah yeah nice you, yeah you just have all that stuff ready to go you can even have docs pages like in the actual like as a plugin next to your code editor that you're just browsing with like um it, it, yeah. Yeah, it'll be pretty cool awesome yeah no then and that kind of gets into a whole uh whole metaprogramming rabbit hole there you've got like uh uh Datadesk, or i think you've renamed it to metadesk now um like that whole idea and then yeah that's yeah. uh it's quite interesting i mean like you uh you just like generate static kind of html based off of that and you just literally like write the docs in line in the code as well which is quite interesting right yeah um uh Metadesk is kind of like divorced from what Datadesk was. It's it's kind of, it's a replacement for all intents and purposes. It's just a much better version of what Datadesk was trying to be. But yeah, I mean, it lets you do a lot of cool stuff yeah, like yeah. that. Like Metadesk itself is documented with Metadesk. Um, although we didn't go the full route that I'm going to go with Telescope. So with Telescope, all the all the API headers are currently handwritten and hand maintained. But at some point. I'm going to move them move them over to being like totally auto generated so that um, all of the docs can be hand like can be in line with the header specification and then all the headers will just be auto generated mm. from the metadesk uh, code so um, yeah probably not awesome, that useful yeah. of a statement for people just listening and they don't know what metadesk is or yeah. anything <laughs> but but uh, it'll be it'll be kind of nice um, to I, I I intend to make the like process of developing telescope like pretty pleasant with when it comes to documentation and all that kind of stuff so yeah awesome do you use much in the way of personal knowledge management tools do you have any apps that you like using for like note taking or whatnot so i uh i got obsidian recently someone sent me something that i needed to awesome. open with it i don't know how to use it yet most of what I oh, obsidian is beautiful. Yeah, it's it's kind of interesting. I I want I want to be good at it. It's at at the current moment I'm not though. So all of my knowledge management is like papers on my desk or text files on my desktop, and uh, trying to wrangle those. Yeah, yeah. Basically, it's it's uh, it's it's not it's not the best way to manage all all that kind of stuff. Oh um, man, dude. I have been on an absolute PKM kick for the last, I'd probably say, uh, it's probably coming up on a year now, but I've been using Obsidian for six months and I've just like, just dove into that entire, like just rabbit hole of, uh, of stuff. I, uh, I took a course that's called building a second brain. That was, that, that was amazing. Oh, wow. Uh, more recently I've gotten into, uh, there's this guy who does linking your thinking and that's very like Obsidian based. Uh, it's like, bottom-up knowledge management cool uh so like yeah no there's 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 a lot of really cool uh concepts in here uh i mean i'd i'd, I'd be happy to send some uh send a few of my all-time favorite links in to help you get started if, if that's something you're looking to do just uh 
learn about Obsidian and some of the really useful stuff. I think uh, just like just from the perspective of uh, future proof, like Obsidian being future proof, that's like really great because it's all in Markdown. It's like the bi-directional linking. So you just like link out to various other files. Like that's very straightforward. Like even if Obsidian were to like each shit in the future, you could easily make like a completely new like version of that. Like you could even do that like with telescope, uh, right. which is actually yeah. something I'm kind of looking forward to is trying out some telescope stuff with uh, my entire like markdown vault. That could be interesting. Uh, yeah. Especially I could kind of work that into docs as well somehow. I think that'd be really nice. Yeah. Uh, because yeah, I don't know, but there's uh, there's just a lot of cool stuff in there. Uh, at the moment, I'm really working on um, this idea of like maps of content from linking your thinking. And it's like, you just go about your day making new notes um, and then those notes eventually map to like a higher order note. And that note is kind of like an index of like all your notes. And it's like a nice way of curating uh, your own kind of like information for your future self and also for other people if you want to share with other people and that's kind of what i've got with my uh whole digital garden up on obsidian publish and man it's yeah there's there's a whole lot of stuff in there that oh, nice. uh, i don't really want to get into yeah I, uh, yeah yeah i want to be conscious of the time here where, where <laughs> we're all like with two and a half hours into this bad boy already right yeah yeah for sure yeah that's that's a whole topic in itself <laughs> yeah that's a rabbit hole i i wish i was yeah, I wish I was better at that stuff. I, I really wanted, um, I guess I do have one example of, of that thing for myself. Now that I'm thinking of it, I do have a Metadesk file so, like on my computer where I, it's sort of like the, the markdown idea, except I have to write, I have to write C to query it and to like present me with stuff I, I want to see. But it's really like, it's so high friction okay. that I just don't do it enough. So... <laughs> It'd be it'd be great to get yeah. better at Obsidian. Um, although one thing that it has been really useful actually is uh, I've been I've been doing a lot of like uh, calorie counting, just making sure I'm not I'm oh, yeah. making sure I'm like doing good like calorie deficit amounts or or trying to maintain if I you know just knowing how much I'm I'm consuming and how much I'm burning per day kind of stuff. And the mm, really yeah. nice thing about that was. Uh, I have um, this is like tangentially related, but I I wrote the four like the four coder calculator plugin before, and that just turned out to be super useful for that because I can just have a text file where I have like variables for all the common foods that I tend to eat, and it's like oh here that's oh, how wow. that's how much this like uh, this particular uh, beverage or this this sandwich that I tend to get is this many calories. And then when I'm setting up my calorie counting, I have slots for like, here's how much I burned in a day. Here's how much I ate in a day. And I can say like, Oh, this sandwich, if I was hungry and I had two, then I multiply it by two. And then I, it's, it's, um, it's pretty nice. Like that, that calculator <laughs> really turned out to be useful. Yeah. So I, I love stuff like that where it's like, it's just, uh, it's knowledge management, but you can sort of have easy access to computability and to, uh, like with Obsidian, the linking stuff. Yeah, like, yeah. That kind of stuff is really cool. Um, reminds me of like Mother of All Demos mm. kinds of stuff, like from that 1960s Stanford computer demo, um, where he's showing like his shopping list. I've heard of that. His... Oh yeah, it's it's awesome. I think it was the first time. I think that was when they showed off like their prototype of the mouse and keyboard interface, and uh, it showed a demo of like okay. this guy managing his shopping list and like he had a map of like where he was going in the day and uh, it was a lot of high tech stuff for the time like very forward thinking um, everyone I apparently everyone yeah. thought he was crazy before like they were like nobody's going to interact <laughs> with computers this way and then obviously like what happens right <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah it was really it was really cool yeah. demo people should go check it out if they're interested in that kind of stuff but what was it called? Uh, it's the mother of all demos. Let me just double check. Mother, mother of all demos. Because he demos like so many things, it's it's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, I think nineteen sixty eight. Yeah, well, awesome. Right, right. I Damn. think this was nineteen sixty eight. Wow. Right. So it demonstrated. Yeah. So it demonstrated for the first time. This is just reading from Wikipedia. Many of the fundamental elements of modern personal computing, Windows, hypertext, meaning like links and stuff like that, graphics, efficient yeah. navigation, command input, video conferencing even, it's pretty nuts. Um, 
Yeah, so... Video conferencing of ASCII art. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even think it was that. I think it was, like, actually... I don't know exactly how it worked, but it was... Apparently, he was... Uh, yeah. The computers were too big. Like, he couldn't take it to the presentation area. So, apparently, he, he had to be controlling the computer remotely, I believe. So they had to they had to okay. transmit the 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 display output over a wire to actually present it at the uh, at the conference hall or whatever, something like that. Oh wow! I mean, yeah, everyone the, should the, the computer would have just been like an entire room of things. <laughs> yeah, like something like that. Like everyone should like go look into it for themselves. I'm not like a, an authoritative source yeah, on this yeah. subject, but um, <laughs> it's something like yeah. that. It's really cool. Awesome. Alrighty. Well, I think that's just about everything uh, that I wanted to cover. Is there anything that you wanted to uh, go over or touch up on? Um, I think I think that's good for me too. Um, yeah, we've gone we've gone a long time. So um, I hope if people are awesome. like, I it's a, a lot of we we try to cover a lot of complicated stuff that's difficult to just talk about without like diagrams and and I've got to work on. Yeah. talking through like the ideas behind telescope what it is and and sort of what it's going to look like and also like all of the low level like memory allocation stuff i probably did not present it in the best possible way so if people have questions just like feel free to ask me and i'll hopefully be able to clarify um you know on your discord server or like you can find my email pretty easily and just email me or whatever um and uh, or dm me on twitter or whatever you want to do but I can clarify a lot if anything I said was like very confusing. So I'll leave a link to your Twitter down below. That's probably going to be the easiest way of doing things. Um, yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Yeah, well, cool. Yeah. yeah thanks, I'm, Randy. Uh, I'm, I'm very excited to get this going and thanks for, thanks for coming in and having a chat. It's been an excellent, excellent two and a half hours. For sure. Thanks for having me. <laughs>